Good afternoon. Uh, the Senate Finance Committee is in session. Uh, we will start by just having a rundown of the bills uh, and the order of the bills for this afternoon. We will be starting with Senator Bailey and Senate Bill 51. Then we're going to Senator McCray, Senate Bill 77, Senator Washington, 595, Senator Bottle, 550. Senator Klossmeyer, 520. Senator Klossmeyer is our champion this afternoon. She's got 651 and then 652. Senator Augustine, 609. Senator Augustine, 639. Senator Hershey, 561. Senator Hershey, 549. And finally, Senator Kramer, 532. So we've got a busy afternoon we want to listen carefully and um, to be as expeditious with our time as possible. So we're starting with Senator Bailey. Uh, you're up first. Um, Senator, uh, you have as much time as you need to introduce your bill. And your chief proponent uh, will have five minutes. All of your other witnesses will have two and a half minutes each. All right, and time is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. Greatly appreciate your time today and the other members of the committee. Today, I have a very simple bill. It deals with a technical correction to put things in line with an MOU that is already signed. We're, what we're talking about is Senate Bill 51, the Tri-County Council for Southern Maryland Property Management and dealing with the Southern Maryland Regional Agricultural Center. This bill would authorize the Tri-County Council for Southern Maryland to act as a property manager for the newly constructed Regional Agricultural Center, which is currently being built in Charlotte Hall in the northern end of St. Mary's County. Saint, uh, the Southern Maryland RAC will be a tremendous resource for the agricultural community both in all five Southern Maryland counties, St. Mary's, Charles, Calvert, Anne Arundel, and Prince George's County. When completed, the rack will include a retail storefront, a commercial kitchen, fresh and frozen storage capability and, fa and facilities to cut and wrap meats, and a space for educational and apprenticeship programs. This facility is an initiative of the Southern Maryland Agricultural Development Commission, which is part of the Tri-County Council. This um, facility is actually owned by St. Mary's County, but SMATIC will be handling its day-to-day -day operation. While last year when we were finalizing all these arrangements, SMATIC's council found that the law outlining the powers of the Tri-County Council did not grant them the authority to manage the property. St. Mary's County, the Tri-County Council, and SMATIC all agree that SMATIC should act as the property manager for the RAC. This bill will institute the technical changes necessary to allow the Tri-County Council to act as the property manage manager, which will actually allow SMATIC to operate the rack. And this just simply reflects and puts in line the, the language that the MOUs between uh, all the parties have already signed. Thank you. And I respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 51. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, okay if not, then we're going to the lead proponent. Shelley Watson Hampton, five minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and all the members of the committee. We thank you for allowing us to testify today on this exciting bill. My name is Shelby Watson Hampton, and I am the director of the Southern Maryland Agricultural Development Commission, also known as SMATIC. We are a division of the Tri-County Council for Southern Maryland, and while we mainly serve the five Southern Maryland counties of Prince George's, Anne Arundel, Calvert, Charles, and St. Mary's, we do also have four statewide agricultural programs that serve all farmers in Maryland as well. Today, we are here to speak on SB 51, which requests a minor change in the Tri-County Council's general provisions 
that would allow SMATIC as their agricultural division, the ability to act as property managers for the new Southern Maryland Regional Agricultural Center, known as the RAC, that is being built in cooperation with St. Mary's County, and that will serve all five Southern Maryland counties and their agricultural producers, as well as the greater Maryland area. The Regional Ag Center will contain a butcher shop, cut and wrap facility, a finer meats processing facility, oh, creation of a Southern know. Maryland meats charcuterie brand, apprenticeship programs and job training, a meat locker and a cold storage facility, a warehouse and distribution site, a commercial kitchen, an instructional kitchen classroom, and a product storage facility. It is also forecasted that the Regional Ag Center will supply full-time employment for 17 Southern Maryland residents. This project has been a collaboration between St. Mary's County, who will own the Regional Ag Center and the land it sits on, and SMATIC, who will provide the expertise and personnel to run and manage the center for the benefit of the region. All parties are excited to see this move forward. So to that end, SMATIC must secure this amendment to the TCC general provisions in order to be able to provide these services. The Regional Ag Center has been a decade in the making and has been a fully bipartisan multi-county effort to bring to fruition for our farmers and producers. It will be the first of its kind in all of Maryland and many within our own region and beyond are anxiously awaiting its opening. Our Southern Maryland delegation is in unanimous support of the project and the technical change to the governing language requested in this bill. And we want to thank all of our area legislators for their fantastic support, especially Senator Bailey and Delegate Davis for bringing forth this bill and its cross file. A fully operational regional ag center with SMATIC's expertise as programs and property manager is vital to the continued growth of the agricultural economy in Southern Maryland and beyond. We ask that you solidly support this bill and we thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Are there any questions of this witness? Okay, we're going next to Craig Tool, the Southern Maryland Ag Development Commission. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll be brief. I am the project manager for the RAC in Southern Maryland. Um, it's to provide, the RAC is generally there to provide resiliency and prosperity to the Southern Maryland agricultural community. It will be anchored by a butcher shop and charcuterie added value operation, which will complete the uh, meat processing needs for Southern Maryland livestock producers. Uh, it will also be an aggregation and distribution point. Uh, there are <clears throat> predominantly small farmers in Southern Maryland. No one farm can meet institutional demands, but through a place where we can aggregate uh, both for produce and for meats, we should be able to then prosper into selling to major institutional uh, establishments uh, throughout the state. <clears throat> it will also be instructional in that the instructional kitchen will be able to teach regulation for several cottage industries. So in some ways it's actually a, an incubator for developing small um, <clears throat> entries into the food service industry, <clears throat> excuse me, and learning the regulations involved, which are considering are making are being considerably increased as time goes on. Um, educational wise, we also have plans for uh, a instructional kitchen to be able to teach cooking skills and the commercial kitchen being able to be uh, available to everyone in Southern Maryland to be able to make in a commercial kitchen right. the products that they would like. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Are there any questions of this witness? Okay, then we're going to John Hartland. The tri county Council for Southern Maryland. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'm John Hartline, Executive Director of Tri-County Council for Southern Maryland, and also the Chair of the Rural Maryland Council. And uh, I've been here about eight years, and I've been working on this project ever since I came here. It's exciting that it's nearing completion. Uh, we ask that your support on this minor technical correction to our uh, legislation that will allow us to operate the RAC. Uh, I can tell you that uh, it gets full support from all the agricultural marketing professionals from all five counties. We had multiple meetings uh, both at the Tri-County Council Executive Board and at the full council. And I believe that uh, from a 
uh, political perspective, this is getting 100% support from both sides of the aisle. So uh, we look forward to your um, favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Hartline? All right, then that ends the testimony on this bill, which everybody seems to like. Okay. We're going next to Senate Bill 577, Senator McCray and Senator Edwards. Um, we, we will, um, let's see, have five minutes for your, your main proponent of the bill and two and a half minutes for each of the other persons. Um, Senator McCray, are you introducing? Yes, ma'am. And I know that my colleague, Senator Edwards, will join momentarily. So I'll get started and I won't okay. uh, too long, Madam Chair. Uh, first, just thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Corey McCray, Senator for the 45th Legislative District. I come to you today in reference to Senate Bill 577, which is the Makerspace Pilot Program. Uh, this pilot program uh, will be in concert with. Uh, um, and what it would do is it would set up an opportunity for matching funds uh, for the year 2023, 2024, 2025 fiscal years of appropriation of 450,000. I think that uh, before I hand it off to our number two uh, from Western Maryland, District 1, um, I just want to lift up an organization called OpenWorks. They're the first one in the state of Maryland to create a makerspace and have figured out how to make sure that incubators um, can thrive and be successful and right here in the home of the 45th legislative district. The state is heavily invested, the city is heavily invested, but most importantly, the community is heavily invested uh, within open works. And we not just wanna see that, uh, that jewel in the 45th district, Baltimore city uh, thrive, but we wanna make sure that it's in every part because this is the future. Um, just of our economy and wanted to make sure that we're putting forward that effort and think that Techco is the appropriate space. Madam Chair, I see that my, uh, uh, my, um, my guy from District 1 has joined me. Um, he's doing some talking and I'll, I'll, I'll just ask for a favorable report, but I'll also uh, ask um, Senator Edwards if he can speak to me. Uh, and and largely, I, I, I never heard of a makerspace and it sounds intriguing. So yes, tell us what it is. A maker, a maker space is the opportunity, and I do have Will Holman from OpenWorks, but I will touch on it because obviously it's in my district. But a maker space is the opportunity for businesses, small businesses, maybe one or two that create things, Madam Chair, um, to kind of come through and be able to reproduce. So they have the equipment, um, they have the resources to make sure that those folks are uh, that are want to mass produce can work in one space and reutilize those uh, opportunities and save money in that uh, aspect. But I know it's a lot more and I don't think that I did them a service in explaining it, but I'll also let Will Holman chime in at the appropriate time. Okay, Senator Edwards, did you wanna just take maybe 60 seconds to say anything about this bill that the two of you are working on? Yeah, 60 seconds. I'm sorry, I had a little trouble getting in. I'm on another Zoom in, in my committee, but uh, I just support what my uh, subcommittee chairman said. It's something we do have several of these in, in my neck of the woods. They're a good uh, setup to help small businesses get a start, that helps to buy space, set up space, buy modern equipment. Uh, and it works real well. We've had a couple businesses start out in these and move on to something bigger and better. And I think it's a good approach to. Uh, to uh, get more opportunity out to the citizens of the state of Maryland to be able to participate in this. So hopefully uh, companies can get started, get moving, and then move out into the community and something bigger. Thanks a lot. That sounds intriguing. All right, we'll go next to Will Holman. You have the five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Senator McCray and Senator Edwards for bringing this important bill forward. Um, so OpenWorks is a nonprofit makerspace located in central Baltimore. Our mission is to make tools, technology, and the knowledge to use them accessible to all. It's been a place I've had the pleasure of working at for uh, almost five years now. And it's also a place where I've been able to learn new skills, meet other creative people, and pursue my creative passions, much like our members and the young people in our neighborhood. We have quickly grown into a national leader in the maker movement, setting new precedents on the ability for makerspaces to deliver economic impact, 
diversifying a field that has been historically unrepresentative of minorities and women and delivering high quality educational programming in fabrication, design, and entrepreneurship to learners of all ages. Every community in Maryland deserves access to a space like this. Additionally, in March 2020, OpenWorks stood up an emergency manufacturing project to combat the then emerging COVID-19 pandemic. This project called Makers Unite eventually harnessed the power of 388 volunteers across the state who 3D printed parts for face shields at home and then shipped or dropped them off to us at OpenWorks for assembly, sanitizing, packaging, and distribution. Over 56 days, Makers Unite produced 28,270 face shields at a time when normal supply chains were overwhelmed. We distributed them to 98 clients, including the University of Maryland Medical Systems, the USDA, the Amtrak Police, as well as a number of smaller nonprofits like Healthcare for the Homeless and the Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition. While we cannot be certain of the impact of this project, we know on some level that it helped protect and perhaps even save lives. This emergency manufacturing capacity powered by advanced digital design and fabrication equipment is critical to preparing Maryland for the next disaster, whatever it may be. Establishing more maker spaces around the state will allow for the rapid spin up of production to meet hyper local needs when normal manufacturing capacity is not available. We have restarted Makers Unite in the last month on January 20th, we launched a second project called the Makers Unite Desk, where we are manufacturing on our CNC router, flat pack desks for low income students in Baltimore City who lack a dignified place to learn and store their devices for remote learning. We have focused on the areas of the city reporting less than 50% attendance on Zoom school as reported to us by the Baltimore City Public School System. On Saturday, we distributed our first 54 desks and have received requests for 4,393 in total. We will be working the rest of this semester to produce the furniture necessary to fulfill all of the demand. This proposed legislation will help deliver high quality services to communities in need, produce sustainable grassroots economic growth, and make our community more resilient, our communities more resilient in the face of disaster. Over four and a half years since we opened in September of 2016, 194 small businesses have passed through open work stores. And to Senator Edwards' point, Many of them have moved back out into the community as they have grown, renting space, buying insurance, buying capital equipment, hiring other employees, and contributing to the tax base of Baltimore City to the tune of 5.5 million in direct economic impact per year in Baltimore City. We think other municipalities would thrive from the addition of maker spaces in their communities. I urge you to support this important legislation. I thank you for your time and consideration and I can take any questions if needed. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right, then we're going to Ronald Williams next. You have Senator two and Benson a half minutes. Waving her hand in. in. Oh, Senator Benson. What you have just said is extremely exciting for me. I want you to tell me how we can set up such a program in Prince George's County. Well, you want him to do that offline, right? Okay. Yes. Ah! I would I would be happy to speak to you offline, Senator. But this bill in particular would, do it. Yeah, would provide planning dollars so that we could coordinate with uh, local government in Prince George's and, and help them get off the ground. Thank okay, you. we'll do it offline because you know what? This is exactly what we need for our people 
and not only in Baltimore, but in the entire state of Maryland. I want to commend Senator Edwards for stepping up to the plate to take care of the people in Western Maryland. And that's mighty wonderful of you. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Senator wonderful. McCray is also working on it for Baltimore area. Thank okay. you, Madam Senator. Dorothy Jones Davis. Hi. <laughs> Um, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and the committee members. Thank you for Senator McRae and Senator Edwards for bringing this important bill forward. Um, my name is Dorothy Jones Davis, and I'm the Executive Director of Nation of Makers. Uh, Nation of Makers is a national nonprofit. We're located in Silver Spring, Maryland, and we're committed to supporting America's maker organizations, including maker spaces, through community building, resource sharing, and advocacy. Although we are a national organization, much of the work that we do takes place locally on the state and regional level, supporting local maker organizations and ecosystems to enhance the impact of the maker movement nationally. Okay. Our Nation of Makers Champions programs identifies local leaders who are champion, championing the maker movement in their region and supports them as they foster a local ecosystem that not only furthers the maker movement, but also the economic, social, and cultural impact that maker organizations have on the local economy. In support of our mission, we are so proud to partner with local maker organizations such as OpenWorks, who are having a significant economic, social, and cultural impact within their community to create opportunities for all Americans to succeed through making where they live. OpenWorks in particular has quickly grown into a national leader in the maker movement. This impactful makerspace has set a new precedent for the ability of makerspaces to deliver economic impact, diversified a field that has had historically low representation of ethnic and racial minorities and women and delivered high quality educational programming in fabrication, design and entrepreneurship to learners of all ages and backgrounds in Baltimore, Maryland. Furthermore, in a field with limited documented best practices, OpenWorks has developed a valuable set of operational competencies that can help other municipalities, such as in Prince George's County, derive similar economic, social, and, eco and educational benefits from makerspaces within the local community. And additionally, and importantly, as Will said, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, OpenWorks has demonstrated the tremendous capacity and value of local makerspaces to serve their communities. Facing unprecedented medical supply shortages, our wonderful state of Maryland found itself in a similar situation as much of the rest of the United States. Makers, makerspaces, and maker groups across the country rushed to fill critical supply shortages and to provide PPE, personal protective equipment for healthcare and, and es essential workers, excuse me, and our most vulnerable communities in need. And they produced and distributed over 37 million units of medical supplies domestically within the United States. I'm incredibly proud to report that as a part of this tremendous effort, OpenWorks through its Makers Unite program produced 28 28,270 face shields over 55 days for over 100 Maryland clients from local hospitals to federal agencies. And I think that number is underrepresented because I think they kept producing. So it might be a little bit higher than that. The proposed legislation we are discussing today creates a non-lapsing fund to be administered by TEDCO that would support the dissemination of open works best practices to other makerspaces and municipalities, establishing makerspaces in the state of Maryland. This legislation will help new organizations increase their ability to deliver high quality, just-in-time services to communities in need across Maryland, quickly scale their audience, and produce sustainable grassroots economic growth. Furthermore, this bill will help ensure the financial viability of these publicly facing makerspaces in Maryland by okay. providing operational support that could be leveraged for growth, productivity, and private. I growth. hate to break in, but we're going over time. And okay, no worries. I just encourage a favorable vote on Senate Bill 577, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And I owe an apology to Mr. Ronald Williams. I called you, and we had such an enthusiastic questioner. I forgot to go back so we could hear you. So you're up next. Okay, thank you, um, Madam Chair, to Mr. Vice Chair and members of the committee, uh, to Senator McCray and to Senator Edwards. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name for the record is uh, Ron Williams. I am a member of Cotton State University College of Business faculty. Um, also served as 
interim dean there from 2013 to 2017. But Coppin State University has had a relationship with OpenWorks since 2016. Uh, they have provided us opportunities to uh, act as a research partner with them, but also to provide uh, opportunities for our faculty and our um, students to be exposed to the entrepreneurial opportunities that exist uh, at OpenWorks. We conducted the 2019 study, uh, greater, um, turning makerspaces into greater spaces uh, that show the organizational effectiveness, but also the economic impact of open works. And also uh, out of that coming into 2020 and the global health care crisis, we wrote the case study of the results of their uh, production of PPE that has been talked about uh, this afternoon. What I want you to understand is that not only did they create over 28,000 face shields in uh, 56 days, but the findings, there were three findings in particular. One was the trust inspired volunteerism that happened. Volunteers, hyper volunteerism happened all over the the city and um, uh, the surrounding area that helped produce that. So the trust inspired volunteerism, the values inspired mobilization because values are revealed in a moment of crisis. This was certainly a crisis, but what was revealed was those values usually transcend all of the things that divide us, whether it's political affiliation or economic, socioeconomic status, the, the values inspired mobilization was significant in that effort. And the third finding, final finding, was their application of lean manufacturing uh, and agile principles uh, in their production and being able to sure up the deficit in the supply chain that really happened in an unforeseen fashion. So I strongly encourage um, that this bill be passed. I think there's a lot of value that can be achieved uh, from spreading this concept all over the state and learning from the best practices that OpenWorks has uh, demonstrated. So that concludes my favorable uh, testimony and I will entertain any questions uh, at this time. Okay, we, we have a very good testimony and I'd just like you to know I, I, I was a dean at Coppin for 30 years. I remember, I've been there for 25 yeah. years. I okay, remember. <laughs> all right. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay. Then going on to Alex Butler, you also have from, from MACO, and you also have two and a half minutes. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Alex Butler with the Maryland Association of Counties. Here in support of Senate Bill 577, I will be very brief as the sponsors and the rest of the proponents have done a phenomenal job explaining makerspace and the benefits associated, uh, leaving me with very little to say. Uh, this is an initiative to invest in makerspace uh, around Maryland. Makerspaces are great initiatives. Uh, they can spark economic development, promote diverse and vibrant businesses. Uh, and this, this in turn creates jobs, helps enhance the quality of life in the area, helps expand the local tax base, uh, all enabling counties to provide better core services for their residents. Um, thank you to the sponsor of the bill and the committee for its consideration. And with that, MAKO respectfully urges the committee to issue a favorable report. Thank you. You guys are doing a good job here. You got the counties all in favor. It looks like we, we ought to be able to vote this fairly soon. Okay, thank you very much um, for your testimony. Uh, we're going next to Senate Bill 595, Senator Washington, Residential Electricity and Gas Supply Billing Information Reports. And um, your lead sponsor, uh, Laurel uh, Pilliner, yep, will, will have five minutes. The other um, speakers will have two and a half each. So thank Senator, you. you're on. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, colleagues. Good to see you again. Um, I look forward to this opportunity to talk with you about SB 595, Energy Supplier Reporting Act, which I believe is a good complement. Uh, to the legislation you've just passed out recently. I respectfully ask all of you today to support it. Uh, the bill would require uh, electric and gas utilities and certain suppliers to submit monthly reports to the Public Service Commission. Uh, the reports would include energy supplier rate information broken out by certain categories in order to compare utility gas and electric supply rates across the state 
but this would just be for residential uh, customers only. Now, why is this needed? Uh, in November 2018, uh, the Office of People's Council had a report, as well did uh, the ABLE Foundation report, and you're familiar with this report. Uh, it really, it showed unequivocally, uh, based on their research, that those who chose third-party supply, energy suppliers ended up paying more than if they had stayed with their standard uh, regulated uh, service utility company. Now, federal electricity data shows that on average, Maryland householders are paying 15 to 20, 20%. We've gone through this data with you. Uh, and it adds up to more than 350 million more from 2014 to 2014. Now, why this bill? So there's no official data compilation. Neither the PSC nor any government agency routinely collects data and uses it to assess whether the energy market is functioning to benefit all classes of consumers. Now we did, this body did pass the Electric Customer Choice Competition Act in 1999. So we're not debating that, but we have not done an evaluation really of that act. Large commercial customers who have the resources to navigate dozens of different third party suppliers are really able to request bids and typically that benefits from some lower costs but that's not true for our residential market. So this disproportionately harms low-income households. This has also been well-documented in other states. Now SB 595 would provide the necessary data. It would also mean that energy assistance from rate payers and private sources meant to reduce energy bills for low income end up doing these 30, we'd really be able to evaluate that. So Maryland has never reported what has actually happened on utility bills. Approximately 20% of our state that chooses to switch their supply from their regulated utility, you know, switching from BGE, switching from Pepco, Smetco, or Potama to these third-party regulated suppliers. That's about 500,000 households. So again, in contrast to the bill you passed out, which hits about 30, 35,000, this impacts about 500,000 households. So in conclusion, I'm asking that you allow us and pass this bill so that we can have an assessment of the state of residential retail energy market in Maryland. The time is now, the existence of data, anecdotally and in small survey does raise some concerns. So SB 595 would give us the actual data and reporting needed to analyze and fix this. I thank you and I look forward to, again, this information is needed to really put the real reforms in place to ensure residential energy markets really function the way that the legislature intended when it passed the Electric Choice Act. I thank you. I ask you for your favorable report. And as the chairwoman said, uh, the lead proponent is well known to you as Laurel Peltier uh, from the Energy Supplier Reform Coalition. And then also I have a panelist, David Lapp, uh, acting as a principal counsel uh, for the Office of People's Council. Thank you so much. Okay, sounds good. Let me just ask one question. Would it be the PSC or the Office of People's Council or who that would actually generate the report and make sure it's readable to average ordinary people? Uh, I don't know if I can answer the second part of that question, but I would say the first part that it would be the PSC. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, now, um, Laurie, Laurel, of Peltier, you have five minutes and the other um, um, witnesses that follow will have two and a half minutes each. Great, thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman and members of the Senate Finance. Yes, you have heard from me. Um, this is, uh, I'm heading of the Energy Supplier Reform Coalition and it's really grown in the last couple of years as the pricing has gotten worse in this market. AARP, Fuel Fund, we've all been talking about this, this issue. There is no reporting, and I just wanted to make for the record, this, is, this would be the seventh request to get this reporting available. And here's why. Um, there's three points I have. I would like to make the argument that this is the same product. I would like to point out why it's so important to know this because the low income bleed. And thirdly, because our gas supply is a black hole. So first, what I want to talk about is a very big issue that keeps getting brought up is that you can't compare SOS to third party supply. But I think it's more like a generic versus brand name medicine. It is the exact same product. 
Um, as a matter of fact, I went online today to CVS and I looked at ibuprofen, 200 milligrams for 100 tablets. Brand name was 1150. Generic was 11 was 929. Why is that important? Because it's the same product. I even have one at my house and I wrote Motrin on it so that my family picks the right thing. This electricity is the same electricity. It's the same electricity purchased at the power plants by the utility and the suppliers. And it's the same electricity and gas delivered to the homes over the same lines. I would argue that what we're talking about is generic electricity versus brand name electricity. And I've been reporting on this. I use a lot of different data sources. I use federal reporting. I use, as a matter of fact, I'm pointing to all the bills right here. There's hundreds of bg &E bills in there. Because the reporting isn't done off of utility bills, we don't really know the extent of everything. But what we do know from the federal reporting is what's happening with low income. And I put this in your, your written testimony. And this is a very important graph because what it shows is that electricity has dropped over the last seven years. Even since the polar vortex, when electric rates for all these variable rates shot up, it stayed at this very high rate of around 11 cents a kilowatt hour. One of the biggest stories we've gotten out this year, pennies matter when it comes to electricity. When households use 11,000 kilowatt hours of gas and third party suppliers are charging three and a half cents more, there's a quick $300. What's even more interesting is we don't have reporting yet we send grants to low income bills. We have no idea how much we've sent to these super inflated bills. So we're taking state and tax money, federal, state tax money and ratepayer funded money and we're paying off these low income bills that are $650 higher, especially especially in the low income area. What I'd like to show you is we sent this, this brochure to everybody and the last two pages, these are the federal data and the suppliers that go into the low income areas, they're charging five and $600 more. It's a lot of money and it goes to a low income bill. We don't know how much state money has gone off for the last seven years to these bills. So it's the same product, it should be reported, we should know the low income. And lastly, I'm gonna to talk to you about something that never comes up in these ever, gas, black hole, absolutely no reporting. This is your bg and &E gas bill. On here, you will not find a price to compare like you do on your bg and &E bill for electricity. You have to go online and find out that gas has been 40 cents for the last four years. So consumers, we have sold 210 decatherms of natural gas since 2014. The average price I see on bills is about 40 cents more. If you just use a quarter, because quarters matter, that's $300 million more that consumers have paid for the same exact gas. There is no way you can't say it's the same exact gas. $300 million. We have no idea because we've never done the reporting. So I think our Maryland consumers deserve for our state to really tally what's going on so that we can make informed decisions. And I would be happy to answer any questions. And I thank you very much for considering this uh, long overdue request for reporting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you did make a really good point that it is other ratepayers and citizens who are subsidizing, uh, thinking they are helping when we really are wasting resources that could be used uh, otherwise. Okay, Thank are you. questions for this witness? Okay, did a good job. Okay, we're going next to uh, David Lapp. Mr. Lapp available? Yes. yes. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Kelly. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. We need to make competition perform better for residential customers. SB 595 can improve the competition experience for residential customers by helping shopping customers identify the best performing suppliers and helping those suppliers reach customers. More information is important for at least three reasons. First, one of the fundamental premises of effective competition is good customer information. 
customers need to know what their options are. Right now, the best source of information for shoppers is the commission's website. The website shows only retail supplier offers. Many of the best offers are short-term or variable rate offers. Most consumers aren't going to shop for electric supply every few months, but consumers have no way to test whether a low variable or short-term short rate that will change in a few months is going to be beneficial or it's going to be risky. HB 595 will provide information on what the consumers for retail suppliers actually have paid month by month and over the course of the, of the year. The commission and the OPC can use that information to improve the consumer shopping experience. The second point is that more information is good for suppliers that wanna compete on the merits. Better information hurts competitors who wanna manipulate and take advantage of customers. But if they wanna compete on the merits, more information is better. The recent amendment to the bill will ensure that only apples to apples comparisons are made and that different supplier service packages are identified as such. Third, information is key to monitoring the market to determine how competition is working and what may be inhibiting competition. No one thought in 1999 that the market would be fully competitive with the snap of a finger or the passage of legislation. The General Assembly gave the commission lots of powers to oversee and assist the development of retail competition. The, the public utilities article contains provisions requiring the commission to determine whether consumer, whether the market is being adversely affected by market power or anti-competitive conduct. It gives the commission authority to issue orders requiring retail suppliers to provide information to, so that customers can make informed choices. And it has sections giving the commission the duty to educate customers about customer choice and to develop a shopping website. The information required under SB 595 is only part of the puzzle. It's not all the information pertinent to the customer's shopping experience, but more information on what retail suppliers are actually paying for services and the kinds of services being offered will undoubtedly help the consumer shopping experience. I'm new at the Office of People's Council. I plan to work hard to improve the market's performance for Maryland's residential customers. More information is good for consumers it's good for competitors wanting to compete on the merits, and it's good for understanding how we can improve the marketplace. We ask for a favorable report on SB 595. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions of this witness? All right, then we're going to um, Tammy Bresnaham of AARP. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Senate Finance Committee. I am Tammy Bresnahan. I'm the Advocacy Director for AARP Maryland. And we've been in here the last couple of years asking for this information. We thank Senator Washington for her diligence and her perseverance on this issue. Um, it first came to my attention about eight years ago when I got a call, several calls as a matter of fact, from individuals from Prince George's County um, who just could not pay their bills and they had excessive fees. And that's why you've seen a number of bills over the last couple of years, because they've been adversely affecting our constituency that are on fixed incomes. They, you know, granted, they should look at their bills every month. Grant, yes, they should, but they don't. And some of them don't have the acuity to look at their bills every month. And so that's why we're the voice of the people who just get taken advantage of. So we ask you to let's look at this information and see what the market is actually doing. We ask you for a favorable report on House Bill 5, I mean, Senate Bill 595, and we thank you for your diligence on this issue. Thank you. Are there any questions of this witness? Okay, and next we're going to uh, William Kress, uh, unfavorable. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Bill Kress here today on behalf of WGL Energy Services and the Retail Energy Supply Association, respectfully in opposition to this bill. Um, I, I would point out that the committee has heard this several years prior and has voted unfavorable on the bill. And 
the Public Service Commission is currently opposed to the bill as drafted. Uh, this, the same issue that we've raised over the last few years is the issue that I'm going to raise today, and it's that uh, retail supply is not identical to SOS supply. Um, we offer products that are multi-year products. We offer products that are 100% renewable or some portion thereof. We offer time of use products. And our concern is how this data is gonna be used and manipulated, frankly, by the Office of People's Council um, and others. What we've seen in the past is there've been studies based on very small samples that have been contorted and put into websites to make wild allegations about what's going on in the marketplace. Um, what this committee has done and the General Assembly has done in the past has passed a website bill, which now has offers from all suppliers, which you can search, which has the SOS rate at the very top so you can compare. You've passed legislation that requires education, training and testing by suppliers to show that they conform to consumer education regulations. We think that's all very positive. This bill, this committee has passed out a bill SB 31 that deals with OHEP customers, which we think gets the root of that issue as well. Um, my client would say that we're, we're here to work with the committee. We understand some of these issues and we're here to make the, the, um, the experience better and then the marketplace better. And we're willing to work with the sponsors. We just don't think that this is the appropriate way to, to go about it. And I would finally say that there is a, this data is available um, from the Federal uh, Energy Information Agency. And so that is uh, obviously available to the OPC if they wanna go in that direction. And, and with that, I would conclude my testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was your testimony that uh, made me look for the written testimony from the Public Service Commission. And they're trying to, uh, um, indicate that um, workability is a problem for the bill. Uh, I don't know if the sponsor and the others who have testified in favor of this bill, because certainly the goal makes a lot of sense, have seen this to see if there are ways of, of, of working around what uh, the Public Service Commission sees as um, making problem with the way you're trying to do it. Uh, so, have any of you seen it? Yeah, yes, Madam Chair. And I actually will have David Lapp talk about that. Uh, that is the sponsor amendment that you see. As you know, in this committee, I all, we always, and we have for the last three years, taken very seriously the concerns of both the, 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 the Public Service Commission as well as RISA and have attempted over the years to incorporate and have in fact, incorporated uh, uh, improvements that we believe. So our sponsor amendments do that. So if uh, Mr. Lapp, if you could explain uh, how our amendment um, seeks to address the concerns about the workability. Yeah, I think um, um, one, of the current, one of the concerns is that there will not be an, uh, or that the, the version without the amendments would not allow an apples to apples um, comparison. The amendments do allow uh, or they require it to be an apples to apples conversion and if not um, for the PSC's report to identify the different service packages. So there would not be um, uh, there would not be a problem if it's a different type of service being provided whether it be renewable time of use that can be identified. To speak um, to the Public Service Commission's um, letter specifically uh, identifying possible problems. It's, it's, um, it's worded um, very conditionally. It says it's questionable and, and it is unknown. We actually have gotten this data from the utilities um, in, in the past in some of the supplier cases. Um, and um, we have heard from the utilities say that this information is available. So we do think that the utilities can provide this information. The Public Service Commission has, um, I referred to um, in my testimony, um, the authority that the uh, commission has under its section 7507 of the public utility article. It gives the commission the authority to require retail suppliers to provide uh, information to enable customers to make informed choices. And so to the extent that there's information that those reports 
need to include to make sure that customers are getting good information that, well, of course, the retail suppliers could voluntarily provide it, but also the Public Service Commission has the authority to require them to provide it. Because uh, uh, the, the chair says that the PSC lacks the authority to regulate retail suppliers. So um, um, our guru on this committee on energy uh, and utilities is our vice chair, Chairman Thelman. I, I'm gonna check with him to see if he's got time maybe to, to work with the um, sponsor or with the work group. Uh. Sure, I, Madam Chair, I'd be, I'd be happy to. And I, I you know, and Mary, I, I'll say the same thing I think with the other bill. You know, obviously we, you know, we do to some extent have to take a look at our regulators point of view if they come in with an opposition letter of testimony, I mean, you know, they are uh, our regulator. And so, you know, if they saying they don't have the authority and, uh, you know, Mr. Lapp says they do, you know, I'm just generally speaking, we're gonna give some deference to them, but obviously there's an answer. We have an AG's office, you know, those are the kinds of issues that uh, uh, I would absolutely uh, volunteer, Madam Chair, to, to talk to the sponsor. Okay, I, I think we need a work group led yeah. by yes, yeah. it would Vice Chair Feldman. If, if, for, if I could just weigh in one, one second um, in response, um, Vice Chair Feldman, I, I would point out that there, the PSC's letter says it doesn't have authority to regulate retail supplier offerings or pricing. That's different. This, this bill would not regulate offers or pricing. Thank you. Okay. okay. I, appreciate, I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That ends the testimony on this bill. All right, going Thank you. to Senate Bill 550, Senator Bidel, and um, let's see, your lead proponent, Aneka Vandebroek, will have five minutes. Other of your witnesses will have two and a half minutes each, and you're on. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Dr. Annika Vandenbrock, Senior Vice President for Easter Seals of DC, Maryland, and Virginia, and Clinic Director for the Stephen A. Cullen Military Family Clinic at Easter Seals. I'm here in support of SB 550. Our clinic opened in 2017 with the goal of reducing barriers to access for evidence-based behavioral health care and reducing stigma for military veterans and their families. And since that time, we have served over 800 individuals in 16 counties across Maryland. In my written testimony, I touched on my own military experiences. This morning, it was very good timing. I received a thank you note from an Air Force veteran that I treated in the past year for PTSD. And she had hid the effects of her experiences from 9-11 for nearly 20 years, suffering tremendously during those decades and expressing a desire to die, seeing no hope of peace or happiness in her future. And her words to me now are, when I remember where I was when we met and compare my state of being now, I marvel. My much frayed past coping strategies would have buckled under the strains of today. They would have failed, frightening to contemplate. I'm reminded to pray for those like me who are being bound still by military culture to protect their record from anything perceived to put clearances and careers at risk. Okay, thank you. We're gonna back up so the <laughs> sponsor has a time I'm to. sorry. That's okay. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair and, and committee for hearing Senate Bill 550. For the record, this is Senator Pam Bidel, District 32. And I wanna thank Annika for her testimony. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present the bill. Um, the Sheila E. Hickson Behavioral Health Services Matching Grant Program for service members and veterans. Um, Senate Bill 550 would create a matching grant program for the community based on behavioral health clinics that serve veterans, active service members, and their families. The program will be named after our former colleague, Delegate Sheila Hickson, who tragically lost her son, a Marine of 27 years, to suicide several years ago. Only nonprofit organizations that serve service members, veterans, and their families will be eligible for the grants. 
The program would be administered by the Department of Health, which would develop the application procedures to be matched by the nonprofit organization. The bill allows, but does not mandate state funding of up to two and a half million a year towards the program. The bill is modeled after a program in Texas that's been very successful in supporting programs that serve the behavioral health needs of the active service members and veterans in the state. We have nearly 400,000 veterans in Maryland, many of whom were deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan, and many of whom are living with PTSD or major depression. The statistics about veteran suicide in Maryland are grim. 18% of all suicides in Maryland are veterans, and veterans are twice as likely to commit suicide as the general public. One eighth of the veteran suicides are by guards and reserves who were not activated and therefore not eligible for VA services. 62% of the veterans who take their own life are not under the care of the VA at the time of their death. As you will hear from our witnesses, and as you heard from one, COVID has made the problem even more pressing with suicide ideation 30% higher among clients of one clinic as compared to before COVID. These statistics highlight the need for support for community-based behavioral health to fill the gaps in VA services through the passage of Senate Bill 550. Thank you for your consideration of 550, and I urge the committee to move this with a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. And before we move forward, uh, do you have any questions of the um, sponsor or of the one witness that we already heard? Okay, we certainly got a good goal here. Uh, let's go to Patrick Goodbile. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, and distinguished members of the Senate Finance Committee. I'm Patrick Gabow, Legislative Chair for the American Legion, Department of Maryland, representing 46,000 uh, members in the 23 states, uh, 23 counties and Baltimore City. We strongly believe Senate Bill 550 will greatly serve the veteran community, especially those suffering from the disastrous effects from mental, mental difficulties like post-traumatic stress disorder and other maladies as a result of military service for those who served and suffered in combat zones. This will be acutely special for those living in distant areas from the VA administ Veterans Administration Medical Facility in Baltimore and in neighboring West Virginia and such counties as uh, in the West and also Anne Arundel, Prince George's and the Eastern Shore. Also lowering the caseload in both facilities and allowing nearby patients greater access. SB 550 will pair these veterans and active duty members with qualified professional therapists at who, as they have at the VA hospital, but without the rigorous and for some costly travel from distant locations. In closing, American Legion respectfully requests the Finance Committee render a favorable report on Senate Bill 550 and we commend Senator Biden for her commitment to the veteran community and as well as those of the bipartisan sponsors. Their desire to serve these wounded warriors, we believe will help stem the estimated 22 suicides daily by veterans and active service men and women. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, then we're going next to Danny Thraw. We don't think he's in there. Mm -hmm. We're checking. Can you go to Lynn Hunter? All right, well, then we'll move to Lynn Hunter. You got to unmute yourself. Sorry, I'm a rookie at this. Thank you. Thank you, members of the committee in the Senate. <laughs> I would like to start in my support of House Bill 872, or I'm sorry, Senate Bill 550, by sharing a little <clears throat> family history as to why this is so important, this grant pr 
program is so important to me. My mother, Sheila Hickson, was a single mother raising four children on her own, two girls and two boys. As a result, we were an extremely close family and very protective of one another. Some say too close. Considering what happened to my brother, I do not think so. My mother joined the Maryland House of Delegates in 1977 and life went on. It was a great life. Each of us went on with our own careers. We were all quite different, but remained close. In 2000, I lost my older brother to cancer, which was devastating enough only to lose my younger brother to suicide in 2010. I don't know how my mother withstood the pain of losing two children, but she remained strong, so we remained strong. My brother came home in 2010 after several tours in overseas, this time in Iraq. Once a Marine, always a Marine. He had only been home less than a week before he died by suicide. From the moment he came home, I knew something was wrong. He called five times a day and that was unusual. He was a private person and kept personal things to himself. However, I knew he was a softy. Yet he sounded so vulnerable in saying that we, that saying things that were erratic and made no sense. I asked myself every day, what could I have done differently? I knew something was seriously wrong. Why didn't I say something that may have changed his mind? We were so close after all. The moment I heard the depression and darkness in his voice, why didn't I fly back to Maryland immediately? I'll never know. The one thing I know is we owe our service members, veterans, and their families support. I asked myself if Todd had had that support from such a program, would things have turned out differently? If I had had access to the program like this, could I have helped Todd through his struggle in any way? I do, my, I do know my experience and Todd's experience aren't unique, unfortunately. It is so important that these organizations can treat our service members, veterans, and their families. It's equally important to have these conversations and develop these programs publicly. We need to give them access to, we need to give them access to such support as well as knowledge that this kind of support will be available, especially in their own communities. There was and still is a stigma associated with mental illness and asking for help, especially in the military. By passing this bill and creating this grant program, we might be able to help reach people who otherwise feel alone and think they have no other options. The burden should not be on the military alone. We owe our members, veterans, and their families so much for their loyalty, sacrifice, and love of country. We must do this for them. My mother continued her support for all of our armed forces for her entire 42 year career in the house. She continues to this day. I thank you for your time and attention and urge the committee to submit a favorable report on Senate Bill 550 to change and save the lives of veterans, their families, and the families of active duty service members in Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of this witness? I want you to know, and I see your hand, that uh, I did get to serve with your mom. I was going to run until 95. And she kind of took me under her wing and helped me a lot. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And Ms. Hunter, thank you for your testimony. I was actually serving with your mom when your brother passed away. And I know that she was devastated. But I think your story is very special and maybe will help us give a favorable report on the bill. But thank you for your testimony. Oh, thank you very much. Hey, Madam, Chair. Madam Chair, could I just yes. say one, one other thing? Lynn, obviously I knew your mother very well, but I, I also met your, your brother several times. And, and I, I just love the fact that we've been able to find a program 
named after your mom, you know, and I, I just think it's great. And, and so I just felt like saying that. So good to see you. Good Thank see you. you so very okay. much. And don't beat up on yourself. <laughs> okay. Oh, boy, we are not God. We just don't have an idea how life will work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That ends the testimony on this good bill. Madam Chair, may, may I finish my testimony? I'm, I'm quite sorry that I went out of oh, time. Oh, you stopped me, but you did stop a little short. I'll give you another minute. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, our, our clinic has witnessed a 30% increase in the number of clients reporting thoughts of suicide and a 27% increase in requests for services since COVID. PTSD, depression, and anxiety are common problems with uh, presenting at our clinic for veterans. These problems are highly associated with poor outcomes for general health, for suicidality, substance abuse, employment, and relationship problems. They affect every aspect of life for our veterans. A 2018 study estimated that early interventions with evidence-based treatment for veterans could save Maryland 35 to $53 million over two years. We urge the committee to submit a favorable report on Bill 550 uh, to help save the lives of veterans and improve the lives of military families and of the families of active duty service members as well. I hope you'll take some time to read through the words of support from a variety of veteran service organizations, the former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and his wife, mental health associations, military spouses, and other individuals who support the bill but were unable to be here today. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. And thank you for your testimony. All right, we're going next to Senate Bill 520, Senator Klausmeyer, Behavioral Health Services and Voluntary Placement Agreements, Children and Young Adults Report Modifications. And your uh, chief proponent is uh, Margot Quinlan. We'll have five minutes. Your other witnesses will have two and a half each. Senator Okay, Klausmeyer, thank you, yeah. Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, Senate Bill 520 adds reporting requirements to the Behavioral Health Administration's annual report of services for children and young adults. With closures of residential treatment centers and de decreases in voluntary place agreements over recent years, it has become evident that an increase in mental health services for children is greatly needed. However, it has been difficult to obtain data to prove this. In 2018, the General Assembly passed legislation that required the administration to publish a report on the availability of these services. While this information has been extremely helpful to advocates when it comes to targeting resources, there are a few areas where a lack of information has been highlighted. This legislation would require the BHA to report information on racial and ethnic disparities in services. It would also require reporting on the availability of telehealth services and residential substance abuse disorder services. Having this additional information ensures that people in need of these services are being targeted in a more precise fashion. With me today, I have representatives from the Mental Health Association of Maryland, Behavioral Health Systems of Maryland and the, of Baltimore and the Maryland Coalition of Families to explain the importance of collecting this additional information. I thank the committee for their consideration of Senate Bill 520 of, uh, um, and I ask for a favorable report. Okay. Any questions of the sponsor? All right, then we're going next to Margot Quinlan. Great, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, members of the committee. My name is Margot Quinlan. I am the Director of Youth and Older Adult Policy at the Mental Health Association of Maryland, and we are here in support of Senate Bill 520. Um, this bill, as was said, really seeks to expand these two reports, the Behavioral Health Administration's report, Behavioral Health Services for Children and Young Adults, and also adds languages to 
the Department of Human Services annual report on these voluntary placement agreements or VPAs. The bill is really building upon the work of Senator Klausmeyer's uh, 2018 legislation, which initiated these reports, um, and which has already begun to provide us with really critical data on behavioral health services for Maryland's children and youth. However, as we've begun looking at the data from these reports, we've collectively noticed that some gaps do remain. Uh, so this bill would help expand the Behavioral Health Administration report to include expanded information about substance use disorders, the utilization rates of telehealth for uh, children's behavioral health, um, and then perhaps most importantly, this disaggregated data on race and ethnicity. Um, expanding the reports to disaggregate the data will really help the state, will help advocates, will help providers to just more deeply target efforts at addressing the health inequities fueled by systemic and structural racism. Now there's an overwhelming body of research demonstrating that it's racism, not race itself, that creates these widening generational health disparities for black and brown Marylanders. And the impacts of racism on mental and behavioral health has been linked to adverse childhood experiences or ACEs has been shown to have lasting impacts on individuals well into older adulthood um, and really presents itself in a few ways in the overdiagnosing and misdiagnosing of mental illnesses, of the increased likelihood that black youth will end up in detention instead of treatment um, and in black adults being 20% more likely to report serious psychological distress than white adults. On top of this, this bill would also add these reporting requirements um, for telehealth, for behavioral health services for children and young adults. And I think we all are pretty aware of just how the expanded use of telehealth has been so critical in um, Maryland's effort to really mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in this last year um, in a few ways by increasing the um, flexibility and delivery of services by protecting providers and patients from exposure to virus, um, by increasing the overall access to care, um, and really, in, you know, sort of expanding our continuity of care for Marylanders, especially those unable to um, access in-person treatment. But we lack key data on how children and young adults are utilizing the services, and this bill would really help fill in some of those um, knowledge gaps so we can better target those services and support them in the years ahead. Um, and then lastly, this piece around the uh, additional reporting language for voluntary placement agreements or VPAs. Um, are, these are really intended to help us um, better understand why some of these gaps remain for youth and families who are seeking a high intensity level of care um, during a mental or behavioral health crisis. Um, and these gaps often lead to long hospital overstays for youth, which put a heavy burden on state dollars and often just exasperate mental or behavioral health systems for a young person um, who is in this moment of crisis. And so we think at the Mental Health Association, um, you know, that this bill will go a long way in expanding some of the already critical data that we've been able to gather with Senator Klausmeyer's previous legislation. Um, and we, as well as our Children's Behavioral Health Coalition, have made this a priority bill for us for the 2021 session. And so we're really just eager to see it pass. We're grateful to the Senator um, for her work and her dedication to this issue and um, would urge this committee to uh, pass this with a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions of this witness? Okay, we're going next to Stacy Jefferson, the Behavioral Health System, Baltimore. Good afternoon, um, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, again, my name is Stacy Jefferson, and I'm with Behavioral Health System, Baltimore. Um, we are a the local um, public behavioral health authority for Baltimore City. Um, so we oversee the system of care for um, persons with mental health and substance use disorder. Um, and as a member of the Children's um, Behavioral Health Coalition, we're here again in support of this bill because the data will allow us to advocate, advocate and target services to address the needs of children and families in Baltimore City. Um, again, the reports that have been previously published have been helpful in helping us um, to advocate, but the um, provisions that are in this bill to increase um, that reporting will give us much more targeted information. Um, we often hear anecdotally about the need for increased behavioral health services for children and youth, um, particularly around residential substance use disorder, even as, um, and then there's also services that have closed. And we've heard that, um, you know, this causes a gap in services, but also have heard from some others that those services were not being well utilized. And so by expanding the information that's required um, in this BHA and DHS report, um, it'll provide us with a much more accurate picture of what those gaps are in those services. Also by disaggregating um, this data by race and ethnicity, 
It'll allow us to address the health inequities that we know exist in our system, especially to better serve Baltimore City residents. Um, and again, also with telehealth, um, telehealth has become really vital, um, a vital part of the continuum of care since the pandemic. Um, and so it's important that we collect data um, and report on that data to have a better understanding of how children and youth are able to um, access these services and are utilizing these services. Um, the expanded data is critical because again, it'll provide us with a much more accurate picture um, it'll give us much more targeted data um, that we can use in order to um, continue to provide services in our state and our local jurisdictions. And so with that, we ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 520. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right. We'll go next to Ann Geddes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee members. My name is Ann Geddes. Um, I'm with the Maryland Coalition of Families. MCF helps uh, families with a loved one with mental health or substance use needs by providing family peer support and navigation services. And I'm here in support of Senate Bill 520. As has been said, um, in 2018, the legislature passed House Bill 1577, which required the Maryland Department of Health and the Department of Human Services to gather data on the utilization of mental health services and voluntary placement agreements by youth and their families. The data reports that have resulted from this leg legislation have been incredibly helpful to highlight what needs to be done to improve the systems of care for children and youth in Maryland. My written testimony highlights some of the really important issues that were brought to light in the data reports. Uh, some of them briefly were overutilization of emergency departments, overutilization of psychiatric rehabilitation programs, PRPs, which are very expensive, underutilization of the 1915I services, which were uh, developed to keep kids out of high-end placements. Um, so a, a lot of things were brought to light in the data reports that we've received already that have BHA has uh, subsequently addressed um, by changing policies and um, changing the require eligibility requirements for the 1915I and building out children's crisis services. Um, so it's been, it, the, the data that we've gotten so far has been really useful. Um, while 1577 was a good start, there are important items that were overlooked. Among the more important of these was the requirement that data about substance use services be collected and reported. We have heard over the last few years that there is very little substance use treatment that is tailored and available to adolescents. We need data about the availability, capacity, and utilization of substance use treatment services by adolescents and young adults in order to begin to improve that system of care. Also, the current data report that we have received has pointed to the overutilization of high-end treatment services, such as residential treatment by youth of color. It has become clear that in order to begin to address the issue of disproportionality, all the data collected needs to be broken down by race and ethnicity, and Senate Bill 520 calls for this. The bill also makes necessary corrections and improvements to language that was used in the 2018 bill. Therefore, we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right. And our final oral witness is, uh, is Lucianne uh, Parsley. Mm -hmm. You need to unmute. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Lucienne Parsley, Legal Director at Disability Rights Maryland. We are the statewide protection and advocacy center for persons with disabilities for the state of Maryland. Um, and we do advocate for systemic reforms and policies to improve services and supports for youth with disabilities. Um, we are regularly advocating and working with families who require a voluntary placement agreement to obtain the care and treatment that they need to address their needs. It's often very difficult for parents and guardians to obtain a voluntary placement agreement. And once a VPA is executed, we continue to see children who remain in DHS care and custody long past when they are recommended for discharge um, because they cannot find uh, appropriate 
supports and services needed. It's really important that community services continue to be developed and funded, including prevention and crisis response, uh, therapeutic foster care, small community group homes to prevent crises and psychiatric hospitalizations whenever possible. And Senate Bill 520 is a needed step to compile data and um, additional data to assess various categories of need. Um, Disability Rights Maryland strongly believes that youth with disabilities have the right to live and thrive in their communities. Um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, public entities, including DHA and DHS are required to administer programs, services, and activities in the most integrated setting appropriate to the needs of the child. Um, DRM supports Senate Bill 520's requirements that additional data be included in the report that BHA is, is um, required to compile and provide to the General Assembly. In particular, DRM supports the new requirements that BHA separate its data into racial and demographic categories so that we can discern whether certain groups are being disproportionately affected um, by the need and the weight for behavioral health and habilitative services. Uh, we also support the proposed requirement for BHA to compile data on the number and median length of stay in psychiatric units um, and in RTCs, residential treatment centers. Uh, and also the number of children and youth who, are, who have uh, developmental disabilities. This information is really critical to understanding how to direct for resources and funding for the creation of new support services um, and particularly community services, crisis services, and services that include wraparound. For these reasons, we recommend that Senate Bill 520 be given a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. We are going next to Senate Bill 651, Senator Klaus Meyer. Hey, thank you, Madam Chairman. Senate Workers Comp permanent partial disability detention and correctional officers. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Senate Bill 651 enhances workers' compensation benefits for Baltimore County detention and correctional officers. Over the past few years, the General Assembly has passed legislation to expand these enhanced benefits to detention and correctional officers across the state. Detention and correctional officers put themselves in danger on a daily basis in order to maintain peace within their facilities. And passing this bill would put Baltimore County in line with four other jurisdictions when it comes to ensuring that these officers have access to benefits. With me today, I have John Ripley from Baltimore County Federation of Public Employees to explain the importance of granting these enhanced benefits. It also, it's also important to note that this bill has the support of Baltimore County Executive Johnny Olszewski and has the support of Baltimore County Delegation. And I have to say that um, I, I um, thought this would be on another day with all the other uh, workers' compensation uh, uh, legislation, but it's not. But we will be having a work group on March 8th and uh, we'll be vetting this in front of the entire uh, workers' comp board that we've been working with over the past years. And I thank the committee for their consideration of Senate Bill 651 and ask for a favorable report. So. Thank you. Are there any questions for the sponsor? Okay. If not, then we're going to uh, John Ripley and you have five minutes as the lead proponent from Baltimore County Federation of Public Employees. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I wanna thank you for this opportunity to testify uh, favorably on SB 651. Again, my name is John Ripley. I'm the president of the Baltimore County Federation of Public Employees, representing about 500 active and retired correctional officers. They're also a proud affiliate with, from, with AFL-CIO and AFT uh, and we ask for your favorable support of SB 651. Correctional officers have a very tough, dangerous, and demanding job, uh, much like police, fire, 
and uh, the other correctional agencies that this workers comp uh, benefit has been extended to. Um, the best analogy that I can give simply is our inmate sally port is a, an 11 vehicle sally port. Uh, and we literally could have jurisdictions. Uh, we could have Baltimore County police officers, uh, Baltimore County deputies, state police, uh, state correctional officers, Anne Arundel County correctional officers, Hartford County correctional officers, Montgomery County correctional officers. Uh, and I believe the list goes on now at this point because there's been additions uh, since 2018. Uh, all in this one vehicle sally port, and we could have a major incident occur, um, our correctional officers come to their assistance. And I know this is hypothetical, but let's say we all receive similar or maybe even the same exact injury and our correctional officers would be compensated at a lower tier than our other public safety professionals. Uh, that's simply wrong and this legislation uh, puts us in line with our other public safety partners. Um, again, I urge your support of SB 651. Thank you. Thank you, Gary Barnes. Any questions for this witness? Okay, we're now going to Matt Tavola. Good afternoon, Madam Chairperson and members of the Senate Finance Committee. Matt Pavola, private practitioner in Baltimore County. Good to see you, Senator Klaus Meyer. She's my senator. I'm privileged to be uh, speaking in favor of this bill that she's introduced as the committee has heard. Uh, there's uh, very little opposition to this. Uh, it'd be hard to imagine any opposition, honestly. This bill first was presented by the Maryland Association of Justice. Uh, this, I should say, the, the change in this law was presented several years ago by the Maryland Association of Justice, of which I'm a member and for which I was privileged to help get this changed in the first place, such that uh, uh, correctional officers were recognized for the first time after decades for the first time recognized as public safety officers, as they should. They are in harm's way every day, not just here and there. Every single day, they're in harm's way. Thankfully, we were able, after five-year effort, get the, get the legislation pushed through such that they never have a minor injury. Me, if I hurt a finger, I'm a lawyer, it's a minor injury. When a correctional officer hurts the hand or any body part, it's never minor. It's always major, very important for their functioning. This bill now will add that protection as it already is for all state uh, correctional officers to Baltimore County where I practice, have practiced for 39 years, proudly so, and live in Baltimore County. This bill is appropriate. We need to protect Baltimore County correctional officers like their brothers and sisters are protected on the state level. Thank you again, Senator Klaus Meyer for advancing this bill. Please, ladies and gentlemen, the Maryland Association of Justice would ask you to render a favorable uh, decision for Senate Bill 651. Senator Klaus Meyer, you know you have my vote since I'm a Baltimore County and <laughs> okay, sounds like a really good bill. Okay, and thanks to all who testified. Okay. Uh, we're going next to Senator Klossmeyer. It's having a very busy day to Senate Bill 652, public health long-term care planning. And um, you may start now. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, Senate Bill 652 requires the Department of Health to create and publish materials for Maryland residents to assist them with long-term care planning. This legislation will provide a more cost-effective alternative for, for those struggling to pay for long-term care insurance. This legislation passed the Senate last year, but did not receive a vote in the House due to the COVID-19. To recap, the General Assembly passed legislation in 2017 that established the Maryland Task Force on Long-Term Care in education and planning. 
This task force put forward recommendations that would establish a sound foundation of vital information about long-term care for Maryland residents. This bill would implement recommendation four and five of that report. Recommendation four requires the establishment of a plan now starter kit, which provides residents with information about planning for long-term care needs. Recommendation five requires a revamping and streamlining of current long-term care information to Marylanders. Recommended, recommendation five would apply not only to the Department of Health, but to the Department of Aging, Department of Disabilities, and the Maryland Healthcare Commission. These are departments that Marylanders would likely contact when they need assistance with long-term care needs. This legislation will ensure that the state is putting necessary information about the need for long-term care planning in the hands of Marylanders who need it the most. The only change to the bill from last year is a delayed effective date to give the department ample time to gather and publish this information during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I thank the committee for their consideration of Senate Bill 652 and ask for a favorable report. And just keep in mind that we did pass it through, so last year. Okay. All right, any questions of the sponsor? All right, then we're going to Sarah Jones Smith as Fossmeyer's major proponent. Uh, you have five minutes and anyone else will have two and a half. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Joan Smith for the record. As the committee may recall, Bryson Popham and I have represented the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors of Maryland for many years, and uh, I am here on behalf of NAPA Maryland uh, with support for Senate Bill 652. And thank you, Senator Klausmeyer, for reintroducing this important legislation. You've heard about the task force created several years ago under Senator Feldman's legislation and the implementation of the two task force recommendations that, uh, which are the substance of this bill. The consensus that that the task force reached is that the state of Maryland should ensure that its citizens have broad access to important information about the need to plan for long-term care long before it's needed and how to do it. I can't honestly think of a more important principle of public health and government encouraging its citizens to think ahead to a time when, you know, given the lengthening lifespans in our society, that they need to provide for themselves when they no longer have income from their employment. So finally, I wish to underscore, as Senator Klausner said, and remind the committee that there is one change in this bill from last year, and that change is a modest delay in the effective date and a modest delay in the implementation date. And as she said, the purpose of that change is to recognize that the agencies um, affected by the passing of this legislation are, you know, knee deep in pandemic related tasks and uh, the change in the effective dates should help ease the burden during this tumultuous time. And just so you're aware, I, I have reached out to the heads of each of the three agencies affected by the bill with this information. It has been four years since we began this journey and there is much more to do, but the passage of this legislation is a very important first step in providing useful tools for Maryland citizens to begin thinking about this important subject long before they need it. NAPA Maryland respectfully urges a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to, any questions for our witness? Okay, uh, we're going next to Eric Cole tomorrow. Chair Kelly and Vice Chair Feldman, Eric Colchimiro, Director of Government Affairs for the Alzheimer's Association in Maryland, and here today to ask for your support of SB 652. The Alzheimer's Association, a longtime member of the United Seniors of Maryland and Maryland's Oversight Committee for the Quality of Care in Nursing Homes and Assisted Living Facilities, has long been concerned about long-term care planning. 
as over 40% of the residents in nursing homes and assisted living facilities have Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. More than 95% of those residents have another chronic condition. Their care is complicated and it is costly. For example, research has shown that the average cost of assisted living in Maryland is roughly $4,300 per month. And spe more specialized memory care can range from anywhere from $5,400 a month to in Montgomery County, well over $10,000 per month. The Alzheimer's Association uh, strongly urges Marylanders to take concrete steps in long-term care planning including gathering their financial and legal documents, estimating the cost of care, exploring financial resources to cover the costs, and leveraging long-term care insurance if possible. Our organization makes, also makes note of the challenges of managing someone else's money, the importance of providing education for rep payees, court-appointed guardians, and trusted loved ones who may be incapable, uh, who may aid others incapable of decision-making. Lastly, we emphasize the importance of connecting with other advisors, including financial planners, elder law attorneys, and elder care locators. This legislation takes some excellent steps to help Marylanders. In particular, distributing information in at least English and Spanish is essential. And the website of, of the Maryland Healthcare Commission can more effectively display information about this essential issue. It also benefits Marylanders to have a hard copy of information distributed. I ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cosma, this is such a very important issue. I'd like to see a few more specifications in this bill. I've had to do this kind of planning now for four different close relatives and it is tough. Uh, and in fact, there are a lot of things that the planner or the potential, you know, you have a relative that's doing fine right now but you see them as seven or eight years out. There are many things you need to start doing even then so that you're ready when they really are in a state of need. So uh, th this is really very important, but I don't, want, I don't know, I don't want the health department to shortcut what they do. They really need a few, few more, I think, specifications just, um, and maybe some public hearings to get uh, information from people. Because they may shortcut this. You've got such an important thing here. We want them to do it right and to give you a comprehensive study back. Uh, okay, um, Madam Chair, I work with um, Sarah and we'll see what we come up with. And maybe we can just kind of put something in there that um, some meetings would be appropriate in different parts of the state or something like that. Okay, that uh, I'll catch up with you because I'd like to even talk to you about some things, you know, that I've gone through trying oh, to- yeah, Yes, when you go through something like that, you know what's what. Yeah, that. thank you. Okay. Very important. Okay. Um, you know, we, Senator Augustine is up next. I'm gonna start with 609. Economic Development, Maryland Industrial Development, Financing Authority Marketing Plan. Okay, Senator, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, members of the committee. Senator Malcolm Augustine here um, asking for a favorable report on Senate Bill 609, Economic Development, Maryland Industrial Development Finance Authority. During the last in interim, Senate President Ferguson put together an advisory group to work on issues of equity and inclusion. One of the categories uh, within that, that uh, work group uh, was on wealth and economic opportunity. The 21st recommendation of that group was to modernize the Maryland Industrial Development Financing Authority to increase its utilization and leverage its ability to assist the state's women and minority-owned businesses. In addition, market the Department of Commerce's credit insurance services to community banks and financial institutions, including those that make loans to historically disadvantaged firms and firms located in rural areas, and consider incentivizing the use of the credit insurance program. And this bill does just that. Um, this credit uh, facility provides gap insurance to lenders to help loans pencil, uh, and the underlying fund provides capacity to support additional lending. In my discussions with the administrators of the program within the Department of Commerce, it seemed like there were some opportunities for marketing to certain lenders who work with minority women-owned businesses, including banks 
and including the National Bankers Association, the voice of minority banking since 1927, whose annual conference I have attended. Colleagues, I ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 609. Thank you very much. And uh, are there any questions for Senator Augustine? Okay, I've got some ideas for you too, Senator Augustine. <laughs> I sit on uh, of a minority bank. I know that, we'll talk, sounds good. Okay. All righty. Okay, uh, we're going next to you again, Senator Augustine for Senate Bill 639. Um, Maryland Technology Development Corporation, TECO, Inclusion Fund Establishment. Okay, and uh, you got the head of TEDCO as your five minute witness and you take as much time as you need to, to open it up. Thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Feldman, members of the committee, Senator Malcolm Augustine here um, asking for a favorable report on Senate Bill 639, Maryland Technology Development Corporation Inclusion Fund Establishment. I mentioned earlier uh, on the previous bill about the Senate President's Advisory Work Group on Equity and Inclusion. And this inclusion fund uh, is a, another one of those recommendations. Uh, as businesses raise capital, they often have to exchange stakes in equity for capital investment. In this process, businesses owned by individuals with social and economic disadvantages can fall beneath the initial ownership requirement to be classified as a social and economic disadvantaged business for the purposes of certain programs uh, at TEDCO, including the Builder Fund. So the recommendation is this, create an inclusion fund within TEDCO to fund economically disadvantaged firms that have fallen below 51% economic disadvantage ownership at the time of application, but have at least 30% economically disadvantaged ownership. And that's exactly what this legislation does. I'm working with TEDCO and we may have some clarifying amendments that I'll bring to the committee I'm asking for a favorable report on Senate Bill 639. Okay, are there any questions of the sponsor? Okay, if not, we're going next to Mr. Troy Lamel Stobel, head of TEPCO. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good seeing everyone again. Uh, thank you, Senator Augustine, as always, for your support and your, your confidence in, in TEPCO. Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, and members of the Senate Finance Committee. My name, thank you again, uh, Chair Kelly, is Troy Lamel Stovall. And I serve humbly as the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director for the Maryland Technology Development Corporation, better known as TEDCO, where we're dedicated to economic growth through the fostering of an inclusive entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystem. I'm here today to express our support for Senate Bill 639. TECO discovers, invests in, and helps build great Maryland-based technology companies. TECO has an obligation, both economic and moral, to create a more equitable entrepreneurial economy by providing investment opportunities and advisory services to not only create and sustain jobs, but frankly, more importantly, to also focus on wealth inclusion and expansion. And to expand wealth, we must tap into the creativity and ingenuity of Maryland's diverse population and its entrepreneurial ecosystem. That lack of capital availability for early stage ventures founded by individuals from socially and economically disadvantaged groups is well documented. A 2017 pitch book study reveals that of the $40 billion, $40 billion in venture funds raised that particular year, less than 3% was used to fund entities started by economically disadvantaged individuals. The study further showed that startups funded by a black man had less than a 1% chance of being funded Whereas for a black woman, the chances were funding were, were 0.2. Again, I want to repeat that number, 0.2%. TECO's Builder Fund, which was established in 2018, is designed to address this matter by providing pre-seed funding and advisory services to very early stage technology companies founded by economically and socially disadvantaged entrepreneurs. A measure of success is the ability of Builder Fund companies to raise subsequent rounds of capital. Since our 2018 inception, Companies that have participated in the Builder Fund have gone on to raise over $7 million. I want to repeat that. Since 2018, companies that have participated in the Builder Fund have gone on to raise over $7 million in seed and venture investment capital. While this is a great success, a common effect of this success, as pointed out by Sen Senator Augustine, is the dilution of ownership share for the economically disadvantaged founder. Senate Bill 639 would provide an option 
for those companies to continue to grow as minority founded and minority led companies. The report of the Senate President's Work Group on Equity and Inclusion recommends the creation of this inclusion fund to quote, allow companies to raise non-state capital while supporting them with state funds. I also want to, uh, to point out to complement the work of our Rural Business Innovation Initiative, RBII, as many of you know, we will soon be launching an effort called the Urban Business Innovation Initiative, initially focused on Baltimore and Prince George's County. Both programs designed to reach underserved communities by providing pre-seed funding and advisor services. With the inclusion fund created by the Senate Bill 639, TechCo will have a comprehensive set of tools to address the wealth gap and the entrepreneurial ecosystem. In closing, I respectfully encourage a favorable report on Senate Bill 639, and I stand ready to answer any questions of the committee. Are there any questions? Okay, you guys must have done a really good job. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thanks so much. We look forward to the uh, creation of this inclusion fund. It sounds good to me. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. All right. We're going next to Senator Hershey, Senate Bill 561, electric co-ops, meetings, and alternatives. Senator Hershey. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. For the record, Senator Steve Hershey to present Senate Bill 561, which allows our two electric cooperatives, Smeco in Southern Maryland and Chop Tank on the Eastern Shore, to hold their annual meetings in person, virtually, or with a combination of in-person and virtual attendance. This allows a person who is unable to, to attend the meeting in person to partic participate virtually and count towards the required quorum of members in attendance. Although the request for this modification was instigated by the social distancing requirements that we saw during this pandemic, we also believe that this will open up participation of the members of the co-op. Uh, although not a local bill, this does have the support of both the Southern Maryland delegation and the Eastern Shore delegation. And I ask a favorable committee for a favorable report for uh, Senate Bill 561. Thank you. Any questions of the sponsor? Hey, hey Madam Chair, just a quick one. So yes. Steve, I mean, what, it's clear that we need a, a bill to allow them to do this. I mean, I would, you would think, I would think they would be, you know, have sufficient authority to do this on their own. I mean, they, you know, you need state law to authorize them to do this. Well, um, may not know what's in their, their founding documents. Senator well, yeah, I'm just curious. Because yeah. I'm thinking about yeah, other, think with other, you know, we have entities all over the state and, you know, different kinds of entities. And I, I you know, the idea that every, entity like this needs some kind of authorizing statute seems, seems, you know, but anyway, I just put it out there. I, again, uh, Senator, there, there is certainly requirements on how these electric cooperatives can meet, um, what their quorum looks like, who has to be in person, uh, again, and everybody has to be in person. You remember last year we had the legislation that dealt with the broadband and okay. this was a concern there as well too. And I think you'll certainly hear from Chop Tank on what they had to do in order to get everybody together for that important meeting that they had last year to discuss the uh, the rollout of broadband. Okay, I mean that, that um, makes sense. I just wanted to ask that. that. I just wanted to that ask. Was that was a good question. Good answer. Yeah, that was a good answer. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, we're going to your major uh, proponent, Tom Dennison of Southern Maryland Electric Co-op. You have five minutes. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Tom Dennison with Southern Maryland, Maryland Electric Co-op here in support of Senate Bill 561. Uh, thank you to Senator Hershey uh, for the sponsorship of this bill. And I, I won't reiterate all of the points that uh, Senator Hershey uh, mentioned, but I, I did want to uh, address what Senator Feldman brought up. And the reason we need the bill is that in statute under the Electric Co-ops Act, it states that our annual meeting um, has to be comprised of uh, 50 members in person attending the meeting. And so what the plan is for this is that we would pass the bill um, to change the statute and have it go into effect July 1. Then we would change our bylaws at our annual meeting this fall to allow us to have 
a virtual in-person or a combination of the two. And I think what that does is it allows us to be more inclusive. Um, it allows more people to attend. We all know how busy things are these days. And certainly under the pandemic, many people in 2020 were concerned about coming to uh, the annual meeting. So uh, in the future, we would like to be able to offer the, the, the opportunity for people to attend in person and to go in uh, via Zoom or another online platform so that they can listen to our president and CEO speak, ask questions, participate in the meeting. So we all um, understand that uh, these virtual meetings, I think, are here to stay. Um, we think that it's a good opportunity uh, for our members to participate in our annual meeting. And as uh, Senator Hershey said, uh, we do support uh, or we do thank the Southern Maryland delegation for their unanimous support on this bill. And, and thank you to uh, Chop Tank for uh, partnering with us on this bill. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. That was a great question and got a good answer. Okay. Um, any other questions for this speaker? All right, then we're going to Valerie Connolly representing Chop Tank Electric Cooperative. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Valerie Connolly here on behalf of Chop Tank Electric Cooperative. Uh, as uh, Senator Hershey said, we had some um, issues this year or this, in 2020 trying to hold our annual meeting. It is regularly scheduled at the end of April. And during 2020, the COVID get, uh, restrictions and the concerns over the health of our members made that impossible. We delayed the meeting as long as we could under our bylaws, holding it in mid-August. In order to provide the greatest amount of protection for our members and our staff, we held the meeting at the main arena of the Wicomico Youth and Civic Center. It's a space designed to hold thousands of people. We limited attendance to 220 and observed social distancing, mask wearing, and all CDC recommendations. Because all members were unable to attend, we also broadcast the meeting live on Facebook. And we found that members liked that opportunity to participate and urged us to continue to use this format for future meetings. Um, I think Senator Hershey and Mr. Dennison explained that the Electric Co-op Act doesn't allow us to use virtual meetings. We actually have a provision in our bylaws that would allow us to have virtual meetings in extraordinary circumstances, but because the law places the current limitation, we're unable to use that, that provision of the bylaws. And it is our intent to just, um, that we would only have a virtual, a full virtual meeting in extraordinary circumstances like we're experiencing now. Um, our members prefer to get together. Our board members like to see members gathered um, to discuss issues and hear the speeches. Um, but we would, we would like in the future, even when we have a live meeting, to be able to broadcast that virtually for the members who feel more comfortable staying at home. So we would urge a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, any questions of this witness? All right, thanks to both of you, and that ends this bill. Okay, uh, we're going next to Senate Bill 549. Senator Hershey, again, you're on. And um, let's see, Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard Thermal Biomass Systems. Thank you again, Madam Chair. For the record, Senator Steve Hershey to present Senate Bill 549. Uh, this is a slight but important modification to our RPS. Uh, currently, in order for a thermal biomass system to qualify for thermal renewable energy credits, the fuel source must be primarily animal manure, including poultry litter and bedding. This bill simply removes the word primarily and allows qualifying biomass so that more forest industry waste can be used to qualify for these wrecks. Uh, Madam Chair, I think you're going to hear some very good testimony from the forest industry on why this is so important. Uh, so important. Um, I do want to, uh, again, caution the, the committee that we are dealing in this bill deals specifically with thermal wrecks. Um, thermal wrecks are, um, are quantified in terms of, of BTUs and then calculated back to form uh, the, the wrecks as though we know them. 
So it's a very, very fractional uh, percentage of the overall RECs and our RPS, but again, very meaningful for the uh, forest industry. So uh, Madam Chair, with these few changes, I ask that we have a favorable committee report. Thank you. Are there any questions for the sponsor? Okay, now your lead proponent is James Matrick, uh, Kit McKittrick, uh, Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And so you have five minutes and all of the other witnesses will have two and a half. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the committee for the record, James McKittrick with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources here in support of Senate Bill 549. Yeah, you have our extensive written testimony, hopefully in front of you. Senate Bill 549 allows standalone thermal wood systems to be an eligible source of thermal renewable energy credits. Current law only authorizes woody biomass as a thermal rec source if it is 49%, less than half, in a animal manure or uh, you know, mostly poultry litter system. So Senate Bill 549 strikes uh, primarily that is currently in statute and allows woody biomass to stand on its own as an eligible source along with other sources uh, in law now. It is important that as we strive as a state to meet aggressive goals to battle climate change, we also abandon uh, ideology and, and elementary thinking and embrace you know, the science uh, and, and, and proven practices. Forestry is one of those areas that doesn't get a lot of exposure in the General Assembly but the ongoing conversation in this sector is how can we keep our forests uh, sustainably managed at the scale we need to keep them healthy? A proven answer for decades has been to use markets. DNR's interest in incentivizing woody biomass is to help tap market forces to increase forest management, leaving our forests healthier and more sustainable. In bettering our forests, the efficiency of the state's largest carbon sink is increased and we mitigate the impacts of climate change in Maryland. Research, research from the U.S. Forest Service and others demonstrate conclusively that wood thermal projects yield cost-effective cost effective greenhouse gas abatements. This is because the forests that generate wood have, have a closed loop cycle of carbon uptake, storage, and release that increases carbon sequestration with certain practices such as forest management and sustainable harvest. Further information on the carbon abatement of thermal wood systems available from the Alliance Green Heat, a fantastic environmental group out of Tacoma Park in Montgomery County. Uh, as Senator Hershey noted, um, Senate Bill uh, 549 is not disruptive to our current RPS scheme. Uh, so I have to say, and perhaps the committee would agree, it is, is a rare day to see Tacoma Park and rural Maryland unite uh, on a single issue. Um, and I urge the committee uh, to take a favorable uh, committee report and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, are there any questions for this witness? Okay, Senator Kramer. Senator Kramer. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. McKittrick, um, yeah, that does cause me concern. So I'll have to be looking very closely at this legislation, <laughs> especially to your reference about science and the climate crisis, uh, which many of us on this committee do believe in. Um, so uh, thank you for your uh, testimony. It was good to hear that. Yeah, thank you very much. If I may tack on, um, since the state has an established Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act plan, um, I think you may be familiar with, with those ongoing efforts. And most recently we have, have a, a, a aggressive plan just came in on Tuesday, I believe. Uh, in every single one of those iterations, increased forest management along with utilizing um, forest materials and woody biomass have been an essential part of that plan in recognition of the role uh, that our forests have um, in, in um, uh, carbon sequestration and mitigating climate change. Thank you. No, I, I'm, I'm all in with the, uh, the, the concept of consistency uh, in recognizing the climate crisis and the need to address it. So thank you for that. Okay. All right. We're going. No, Madam Chair, there, we yes, were, I think Senator Augustine had a question. Then I, I had one question too. But okay, Senator Augustine and then Senator uh, Feldman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Mr. McKittrick, I, I just, you know, I really do also really care about the science of these things. And I, I would just ask, you know, we're, we're talking about climate change. 
mean, can you can you talk about sort of the the way that force and off gassing that's occurring outside of of this process? I mean, I, I really do worry about, um, or rather, I think about I think about that within the context of of climate change. What are we really trying to get after here? And and, and making sure that the science supports um, us reducing our impact on the, on, the, on the climate. Can you just talk to that for me a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I, and I also just want to recognize, I think there's some fantastic panelists um, that are going to be following me who are far uh, um, more well-versed in the technology and specifics on emissions. Um, but from a, a macro standpoint, which I'm here to represent, um, you know, the carbon cycle for our forests is a closed loop cycle. Now that kind of begs the question, what is an open loop cycle? Well, that's fossil fuels. You take fossil fuels out, you combust them and it releases CO2. Um, with the closed loop carbon system it recognize, uh, for, for forests, it recognizes that forests are constantly in a cycle of uptake, storage and release. Um, you know, as, um, you know, as trees grow, right, they absorb more carbon. Um, as they're managed in a healthy way, they're able to continue to take more and more carbon and store that. Um, that carbon can be stored in the form of wood products. Um, that carbon, um, you know, can be just stored in the, in the trees as they grow healthier. However, trees are mortal, just like anything else. Um, and trees and, and forests that are not well managed or, or, or you know, it's, it's, you know, some, something out of, you know, a night, you know, a nightmare forest, ugly forest, dark forests, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it does not capture the carbon that it needs to, to be successful. Um, and, you know, trees die, as I talked about before, uh, that releases the CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. So the idea is in Maryland with our forests, we need to be getting to a place where we have consistently healthy forests. So as, you know, as this cycle and this, this, this loop goes, um, we are not releasing any more on net through, you know, dead trees, trees, you know, tree products, um, you know, uh, in landfills also, you know, with the rot releasing methane. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to talk more on, uh, offline and in, in depth, uh, about that. Um, but, you know, I can tell you that in terms of carbon sequestration, uh, of our forest, the rate is actually slowing. Uh, and that is correlated with the fact that the forest industry in Maryland has, you know, um, been consistently knocked down by one thing or another, whether it's the Luke Mill closure or, you know, international markets, or, you know, there's all kinds of, uh, of reasons for it. And, and in fact, as folks I'm sure we'll talk about, um, uh, currently the state is working uh, in, in consultation with other partners in the forest industry on um, an economic adjustment strategy. And um, this bill, excuse me, um, this bill is actually um, part of, uh, uh, of one of those recommendations. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for this witness? We're, I'm, I'm good. Can I, like a, can, can I just ask a question? Yeah, just real, I, I do want to hear the other uh, witnesses. It looks like there, there is a, um, a pretty solid panel. And I, I apologize, you, you, you know, the whole, uh, you're going to have to refresh my, you mentioned this old Tacoma Park DNA. DNR Alliance, and it caught it, certainly Senator Kramer's attention to mine. Is it just because they don't have, there's no testimony from Tacoma Park here. So just one more time, what were you saying about Tacoma Park? Uh, so we, I think a gentleman, we have a gentleman, John uh, Ackerley, I believe is on the call, uh, who represents the Alliance for Green Heat, and he's based in, uh, out of Tacoma Park. Okay, I'll, I'll listen. His group is based out of there, yeah. Fair enough. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, any other questions for this witness? All right, now we're going next to Daniel Wilson, Biomass Thermal Energy Council, and each of these succeeding witnesses, we have several, we'll have two and a half minutes each, okay? Well, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak in favor of Senate Bill 549 this afternoon. For the record, my name is Dan Wilson. I'm a registered engineer in Maryland, and I own an engineering firm that specializes in energy efficiency carbon accounting and renewable energy system design. 
And I'm also the current chair of the Biomass Thermal Energy Council and speaking on the council's behalf today. As you review this bill, I would like you to identify, I would like to identify the following points for your consideration. Uh, number one, Maryland has a desperate need for markets for the residues from forest management. Without markets, these useful materials are treated as waste and the cost of forage management is increased. Number two, the most efficient use of these resources and residues is typically their beneficial use to replace fossil fuels for heat. Number three, sourcing thermal energy locally keeps dollars spent on heat in the local economy and grows wealth in Maryland's communities. It is important to note that the jobs created for this energy source are ongoing and not just during construction. Number four is that MDE very recently completed a multi-year regulatory and rulemaking process that specifically evaluated and promulgated rules for commercial wood energy systems. This ensures that wood thermal systems in Maryland are both clean and efficient as per MDE's new rules. Number five, Maryland's greenhouse gas plan relies heavily on forest ride a carbon sink and very specifically relies on increased forest management to achieve carbon goals. Now, by definition, the plan will drastically increase the amount of byproducts or residues from forest management activities in the state. This isn't already in an environment where there's already a lack of markets for this material. Number six, renewable options to replace fossil fuels for high temperature heat demands are extremely limited. Wood energy systems using residues are uniquely suited for these applications and a critical option to keep open and available for hospitals, universities, and industrial manufacturers that wanna address their carbon emissions in a cost-effective way. And finally, number seven, Maryland already provided a thermal rec for wood at residue systems that use 50% or more manure. Modifying this to allow systems that use 100% wood residue would open access to this, the benefit of the RPS program here to more geographic areas of Maryland and more communities within the state. Again, I thank you for your time and urge favorable consideration of Senate Bill 549. Are there any questions of this witness? Okay. All right, we're going next to uh, Gary Allen. Is Mr. Allen here? Thank you, Madam Chairman. My name is uh, Gary Allen. I'm the president of the Maryland Forestry Foundation, and I'm pleased to provide strong support for Senate Bill 549 in today's testimony. I wanna thank Senator Hershey and Senator Edwards for helping move this forward. This modest revision to the state's RPS standard to authorize the use of qualified biomass uh, to be eligible for renewable energy credits is an essential step forward for forestry in Maryland. With these changes, we believe the entire forestry community can move forward with making biomass a part of Maryland's renewable energy future. We think these changes are long overdue and have spoken often in support of this change before you and other committees in the past. In this past year, in partnership with more than 20 other organizations and three state agencies, we helped plan and present a series of webinars to which many of you were invited and several of you may have had the opportunity to attend. And out of that process, we found that the defining characteristic for progress in the use of biomass was the modification of this language in the law. And you'll notice this modest bill is hardly more than a page. But there's a clear consensus that has emerged that this principal barrier once removed and broadening this definition to qualify biomass and biomass energy systems will help correct the problems that we've encountered in creating markets in this area and allow us to pursue a strategy statewide for small combined heat and energy projects. And I emphasize that this we feel probably is a niche market in the future of our renewable portfolio standard. And let me stress as others will too, that biomass energy can meet tough energy efficiency goals. It can meet strong air quality standards and it can provide an excellent and competitive economic investment with an assured supply chain in the future. 
forests will never be removed simply for biofuels. But what we find is that the residue in municipal operations and in other forestry work around the state generates more than enough to provide support for these types of projects. Madam Chairman and members, we urge your favorable report of this bill. Thank you very much. It does scare me a little bit though. <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, let's go to Colby Ferguson. John Atherley. Oh, I'm sorry. John Atherley, number five. All right, John Atherley, that's what we should be. Thank you, Madam, Madam uh, Chairwoman and uh, uh, Senator Feld Feldman. I'm uh, John Ackerley, I'm based in Tacoma Park. Uh, as you know, uh, we are not the most conservative jurisdiction in Maryland, but we do have a very strong history of supporting thermal biomass. Uh, Mike Tidwell uh, started the corn co-op in Tacoma Park before he founded the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. And he recognized that biomass when used for heating is a very carbon beneficial form of energy. Um, he continues to heat his house with, uh, with wood as does Heather, Heather Mazur. Now Heather Mazur in 2012, one of your former colleagues on the house, house side, she worked uh, very hard with the Maryland um, Energy Administration to set up a wood stove rebate program again, using wood or pellets for heating. Um, now I should say, I think you know, the biggest uh, controversy that's come about around this is because a lot of people think about the publicity that has come from shipping pellets to Europe to make electricity. Now groups like mine um, and most environmental groups would not support using biomass for electricity. And one of the reasons is, one of maybe the main reason is you, when you burn it for electricity, you're getting about 30% efficiency. So you lose most of the tree to waste heat. When you burn it for heating, you get 80% efficiency. But equally important is at the industrial scale for electricity, you're harvesting whole trees. You really are cutting down forests. In this case with heating, you use residuals uh, at smaller scale. Uh, the the uh, fuel has to come locally because it's too uh, expensive to transport. So there really may be no trees in Maryland cut down as a result of this wreck. Trees are cut down to build houses. And when you cut, when you cut down a tree, about half that tree is not commercial lumber. So it has to go somewhere. It can go to pulp and paper. It can go to um, make a mulch or what have you. I think one of the best ways to use it is to displace fossil fuels. Um, and that's certainly the path that uh, you know, Austria and Germany has gone is to really prioritize using biomass for heating, not for electricity. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that, uh, you know, the per unit of heat, the most, the cleanest way to burn biomass is in these larger plants that would heat a building or a school, for instance, because you put ESPs on them, electrostatic precipitators. Um, they are required for these systems. And in, we're lucky in Maryland, the Maryland Department of um, the Environment has staff that knows these, these uh, regulations well and will implement them. Um, the worst in terms of particulates, the residential wood stove is really the most problematic. And if you wanted to reduce wood smoke in Maryland, it would really, the best way would be to reduce wood burning in homes, particularly in more, um, urban areas. Your testimony is actually interesting, but you run out of time. Okay, well, that's fine. I made my most important points. I missed the deadline to submit my uh, testimony electronically, but I emailed it to each of your offices. So happy to take questions. Okay, well, all I can say is that I worry to think that we're talking about burning anything as bad off as the climate is right now. Okay, uh, let's go to... Uh, yeah. Colby Ferguson. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau, and uh, we come in support of uh, Senate Bill 549. Uh, I think there's been a lot of uh, great discussion on the value of, of using uh, this uh, woody biomass as a wreck. Um, obviously, uh, we 
we've looked into lots of opportunities to try to use uh, poultry litter on the on the shore uh, in as an alternative use. Uh, those have have uh, they're still in production, still trying to determine whether they're actually viable or not. I think where I want to focus the the limited time I have is uh, to really discuss. Uh, I know there's the big opposition to this, and I, and I heard Chair Chairwoman Kelly uh, kind of talk about the burning or the uh, and what emissions would be created. And and I think the thing that we need to make sure we focus on is don't uh, don't just focus on one single thing. Think about the life cycle of the tree. And there's basically two two components within carbon. Uh, one is carbon storage, and one is carbon sequestration. And and carbon storage is when you actually store it in in the forest pool or in the forest area, whether it be in the tree, the leaf, in the ground, in the soil. Um, but that's the, the actual storage. And so the longer a forest is there, the more it stores, and the more it stores until finally it would actually kind of uh, hit, a, hit a plateau, but that's at a very, uh, very old forested area. But the key that I wanna focus on is carbon sequestration. And that's the, that's the buzzword that we're hearing right now when we're talking about climate change. And there's basically two sinks to doing that. One is active agriculture and forest. Uh, those are the only two that really sequester carbon that really, and what that means is the process of removing carbon from the atmosphere for the use in photosynthesis, resulting in the maintenance and growth of plants and trees. That's what, photo, that's what carbon sequestration is. So sucking the carbon dioxide and the greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and putting them into the tree or into the plant. And I would say that an active forest management, managing an active forest is going to do that at a higher level because trees maximize their carbon sequestration at about 30 to 70 years old. And so by just planting trees, as you'll hear, just planting them and leaving them doesn't really give us a better carbon sequestration than if we actively manage those trees in a well-managed forest. So I will stop there. Uh, any questions that anybody has, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Are there questions of this witness? Okay. Um, we're going to Beth Hill. Hi, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 549 with the clarifying amendments suggested by AFI and MFA um, that were submitted in our written uh, testimonies. I'm Beth Hill, Executive Director of the Maryland Forest Association. MFA is a nonprofit 501c3. 70% of our members are family woodland owners. We are a conservation minded group that wants to see forest remain as forest and believe that this is best accomplished by promoting sustainable forestry practices and encouraging strong markets. There are approximately 158,000 private forest landowners in Maryland that depend on strong markets for their wood regardless of their management goals. Having various outlets ensures proper utilization is available to address forest health concerns. Strong, strong markets also provide financial incentives that enable families to retain ownership. Without them, woodland is prone to land use change and fragmentation. The industry is not a threat to the forest, but is instead an integral part of its long-term success, health, and viability. Our forests are in trouble because we have seen such a rapid decline in the forest products industry over the last several years. MFA is not alone in its concerns. Last year, federal grant funding was received to develop an economic adjustment strategy for Maryland's forest product sector. The administration widely supported the initiative. Uh, the Department of Commerce, Natural Resources, and Agriculture were among the funding partners. Although the final report has not been released, key early findings show biomass is one of the most promising opportunities. Their analysis showed 2 million tons of wood from urban and rural sources could be utilized annually to fuel thermal energy systems. The biggest hurdle is the current RPS language, which requires a specific recipe to utilize wood, which is also loosely defined. Passage of this legislation would remove this barrier. Um, my members are good stewards of the land, uh, managing private land for the public benefits of clean air and water. They are excited about the economic benefits that biomarkets uh, could provide and also allow them to engage locally in climate change solutions. Um, MFA also serves on an advisory committee to an urban wood initiative starting in Baltimore that's looking to establish companies that reuse, repurpose, and recycle urban wood. Um, 
diverting it from landfills where it's cur currently converted to um, harmful methane emissions. A uh, CHP or biochar project would be a perfect fit in this area. Um, clearly, uh, in my mind, this bill benefits all Marylanders. It, um, uh, it's, it's much more than just an energy bill. It also creates and retains jobs um, and the technology that would have to be used to meet the strict air quality rules would limit the systems to the cleanest and most tech, um, efficient technology available. On behalf of the forest community and the local economies that would benefit by developing modern thermal projects used um, using um, renewable resource in place of fossil fuels, I respectfully ask you for a favorable review with amendments. Um, and Madam Chair, I know that uh, this one document that I'm not sure if anyone has shared with you, um, I understand your concerns about burning anything, um, but really these thermal systems are designed efficiently. MDE just recently did um, an upgrade to, you know, their, their regulations that these systems have to, um, have to meet. And uh, this is a, um, a paper produced by the USDA and US, US Forest Service that shows the comparison of, of wood, I'm not sure if you can see this clearly, of okay. wood to fuel oil, um, propane and natural gas. So clearly uh, their emissions, uh, carbon emissions are off the chart where wood is, you know, with this new technology is, is barely even there. So it's a lot cleaner, better source than what we're using now. And again, I ask for your favorable review. Thank you. Are there questions of this witness? All right, we're going finally to Doug Myers, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Doug Myers. I'm the Maryland Senior Scientist at Chesapeake Bay Foundation. We are opposed to this legislation. Uh, the primarily language that was in the bill previously was in order to help uh, the biomass that is contained within poultry manure to be used in uh, the decomposition or biogas digestion processes that are uh, termed the alternative technologies that are uh, being put online to be able to deal with the excess manure. Uh, that was going into primarily the Eastern Shore farms, um, resulting in the need for the phosphorus management tool. So that was where Chesapeake Bay Foundation supported the use of the primarily language. Um, removing that language does open up, and I think you should trust your instincts, Chair, that um, this is burning. Um, this is burning, it's burning it slower sometimes, it's burning it in such a way that it will have less particulate uh, pollution um, but it's still going to produce nitrous oxides and it's still gonna produce carbon dioxide. The, uh, the real uh, promise of biomass uh, thermal systems is that they would be able to replace fuel oil as a primary source. And so unless that's actually happening, and I don't think this legislation would make that happen, you're not going to realize the kind of carbon sequestration uh, benefits or the carbon uh, dioxide reduction benefits uh, that the proponents are claiming. Uh, the last thing I'd say about it is that forest management is a complicated thing. We manage forests for a lot of different reasons, not just the production of wood. Um, the reason there is waste that is created from uh, the, the harvest of forests is that they're clear cut and they leave a lot of those branches behind. Uh, and then they're often burned on site or they're uh, turned into waste uh, fuel, but they don't have to do that. Those, uh, that amount of biomass could be a, uh, put into the forest floor as uh, rotting logs that are going to support dozens of other species. Uh, you can selectively remove the oldest trees and that way you can manage a forest so that you have that actively growing 30 to 70 year old cohort uh, that is actively um, sequestering carbon uh, and you don't have to cut down the whole forest at one time uh, and then burn what's left over. So I think there were kernels in truth in all of the testimony you heard previously but Chesapeake Bay Foundation would like to uh, urge an unfavorable report on this on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for this witness? Senator Hershey and Senator Augustine. Senator Hershey and then Senator Augustine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Doug, thanks for your comments. I'd say the same. I think there's kernels of truth in your testimony as well. 
Um, one of the things you'd spoken about was the uh, fuel oil replacement. Well, that's certainly going on on the Eastern shore um, at the hospitals, at the correction facility, uh, UMES have all found ways to um, use woody, uh, woody biomass in, um, in their heating facilities as well. Um, in your testimony, you, you, know, you talk a lot about uh, manure, which again, this bill really doesn't um, hurt manure in any way. It just doesn't have to be the primary source. It opens it up for, for additional sources. Um, but you speak about the phosphorus management tool. We've, we've discussed that many times and as uh, um, Sir Kobe knows and, we, and you know, as a representative of the farming community, that has been a big concern but right here in, in your testimony about that, you also speak about the manure transport program. Uh, again, that type of system is something that we've, uh, in working with what we've been able to do with uh, uh, manure on the lower shore um, through anaerobic digestion is, is to avoid having to do any type of manure transport program. Um, I think the program is set up to find ways to fund it, but certainly, um, truckloads full of diesel, uh, truckloads uh, full of uh, manure going up and down the eastern shore, uh, burning diesel fuel was not something that we thought environmentally friendly either. Um, I've got a question though, because again, this seems to be coming down to a burning question. And um, you had mentioned several small scale manure incineration facilities have failed to demonstrate um, effective heat production without significant air pollution. That's in your testimony. And um, to kind of rebut that, and also I think to address the chair's question, um, in order right now, and this is current law for a thermal biomass system to be eligible, um, there are two main important uh, roles with uh, uh, considerations. Um, one is its anaerobic digestion, which this is not. But two, if it's to receive energy credits, um, the Department of Environment must demonstrate that the operation of the thermobiomass system, two different things. One is not significantly contributing to a local or regional air quality impairments. So that would kind of address the issue that you have in your testimony, unless you don't trust MDE to be able to make that determination. Um, and then the second part would be that it would substantially decrease emissions of oxides of nitrogen beyond that achieved by a direct burn combustion unit through the use of pre-combustion techniques, combustion techniques, or post-combustion techniques. Why isn't that enough to address your concerns that uh, this is not a burning process or this is not something, um, again, that your testimony says uh, pro pro uh, provides significant air pollution? Okay, there was a lot to respond there, uh, Senator Hershey. I'll try to do my best. Um, the animal, animal manure um, biodigestion to create biogas significantly reduces the weight of what needs to be shipped and it concentrates the phosphorus into um, smaller uh, shipments that can go into the fertilizer industry. Um, so that's, that's answering the, positive, the right? support we had and for how it would help with the phosphorus management tool. Cause I agree shipping manure all over the place is not, um, not a very friendly thing to do. We need to deal with uh, the, the weight and the concentration of those nutrients in order to be efficient. Um, the, to address the burning, it's again, I'm going to talk about two different kinds of pollutants. The, the uh, regulations that MDE places in the latter half of that, that bill are really about local water, uh, local air quality that would affect things like human respiratory illnesses, things like particulates, um, volatile organic compounds. It's, it doesn't have to do with greenhouse gases. So there's still going to be any time you incinerate anything, even if you're using the most clean technologies, you're going to be cleaning up the particulates and the volatile organic compounds, not the ca carbon dioxide. You're still going to be releasing carbon dioxide. Now, the way I'm glad that. Colby mentioned the, the life cycle. I would like to see some life cycle analyses of these uh, technologies, especially when you have to consider the number of years a tree has to grow, how much wood is generated um, from forestry techniques, and then how much of the uh, carbon dioxide is emitting from those uh, technologies 
relative to or against the carbon sequestration of the forest. To know that it truly is a carbon reducing technology. Uh, again, I'm saying unless we really have a displacement of fossil fuels um, and that we can demonstrate that, I don't see this particular technology as uh, reducing actual carbon dioxide emissions on the whole. And I also don't see them uh, uh, being able to uh, not displace uh, what we're already currently doing in the renewable uh, portfolio standard. Okay, so a couple of questions. Um, real quickly, you would, you would agree though that a healthy forest would contribute to a healthy bay, right? Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and that, okay. the way that a healthy forest gets maintained is that most of it's covered in trees, not that it's chopped down. Well, you might. So, so are your real concerns just against the forest industry in general then? No, I mean, no the so forest sounds, industry has the capacity to do all kinds of uh, management. Uh, there's management techniques that have been around for decades that selectively remove the oldest trees and leave the majority of the forest there at any given time. Doing so actually increases the carbon sequestration potential of those forests, as well as maintaining its wildlife and habitat uh, and, and water quality benefits. Okay. Um, and finally, I just I want I want to mention one thing. You know, and and you guys have talked about the Clean Energy Jobs Act and where we've gone with that. Obviously, we've been struggling with Maryland jobs uh, related to to CJ. Um, in 2019, I think only. 9% of the tier one non-solar recs were retired from in-state. Um, again, your testimony, that of Sierra Club, seems to always want to focus strictly on wind and solar, um, but obviously we're not uh, you know, seeing any new type of wind uh, generating facilities in Maryland. We probably won't see any. There's not any, anything in the queue there either. Um, Maryland's next largest tier one non-solar uh, contribution was municipal solid waste. Uh, that's obviously under attack. Black liquor under attack. I, I just want to, from a jobs perspective, and, and again, I know you're not testifying on the CJA, but you're certainly familiar with it. CBF has been around for that. The questions then become about what do we have left in Maryland to look for from a clean energy jobs perspective? And I thought one of the most important things about these thermal wrecks is they need to be retired in Maryland. They need to be generated in Maryland and be part of, of our system here. So we are able to create green jobs as a result of opening up um, this into the woody biomass. Are you guys not uh, seeing that? Is that not important in your, I mean, again, I know you're a scientist, but is in your overall analysis of what we're trying to do here, is the jobs perspective, the part that this is from Maryland, is that, is, is that not important to you guys? Uh, we're, we're not a jobs organization. Certainly we are a water quality organization and we're re re reviewing legislation based on its ability to affect the Bay. I do okay. think there is a possibility for a, um, say the, the sawdust that swept up off the floor uh, of a sawmill to be able to be put into uh, products that are useful. I think the whole building that I work out of is made out of stuff like that. Um, so there's all kinds of ways to manage forests, all kinds of ways to build uh, wood products that will permanently sequester the carbon uh, without burning any part of it. Um, and I think all of the work on uh, wind, solar, and biomass, or I'm sorry, uh, geothermal is needing the, the uh, space to be able to expand without competition from burning something. Um, I think it's the step in the wrong direction. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank uh, you, uh, Doug. Senator Augustine. Senator Augustine. Thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate that. Um, you know, Mr. Myers, your, your testimony I literally just like lit a light bulb for me because I've always kind of struggled to understand some of this, the testimony that I hear from some of the advocates, but it just really crystallized for me. Um, and it is that your testimony is about the impact on the Bay, much more so than it is on climate change. And I think that that is finally like a light bulb that finally has gone off for me. So my question for you is the unmanaged decomposition in landfills versus 
a managed combustion, which we know the, the, the unmanaged decomposition in landfills is much worse for the, for the environment, I'm sorry, for with regard to climate change versus managed combustion. How do you, how do you square that? Or is it that you really are more, you have other interests and not necessarily around climate change? No, I mean, uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation's increasingly uh, engaging in climate issues because if the climate's not brought under control, it doesn't matter what we do to save the bay. So um, we are engaging in that space. We're taking a look at, from a scientific perspective, these life cycle uh, emissions. I think um, many modern landfills, I don't know if all, uh, have methane capture systems where they can co-generate electricity or produce heat. Um, I think our best bet would be to um, continue to put those kinds of systems into existing landfills and continue to divert organic waste away from landfills. Um, but putting wood waste into landfills probably has not, never been a good idea, um, but it also doesn't need to be burned in order to not go into a, a landfill. So uh, where so, would you go with it? I mean... Uh, yeah, so uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation's headquarters building uh, in Annapolis is built mostly out of recycled lumber um, that has been pressed into uh, wood framing materials, both exterior and interior. There's a huge green jobs market in producing those kinds of materials wow. for building that are using wood waste from uh, uh, the very sources that would be filling up our landfills. So all I'm saying is there are existing ways to make durable products out of waste wood that don't include burning them. So, the, so what I appreciate with what you said though, which is the important part, which is that you acknowledge the fact that it going into the landfill is very dangerous. It's, it's damaging to uh, both our climate change and to the Bay. I mean, we've got- Absolutely. Some leaching going you know, from the landfills. Um, and so, uh, that that um, you, you've answered my question. It's kind of it has kind of crystallized a little bit for me now. Just sort of what what's what's going on here. So thank you so very much. Thank, thank you. you for the question, Senator. Okay. Are there any other questions? All right. Thank you. Um, what do we have now? Beth? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm, oh, that's it. We got it. Okay. All right, and our final bill this afternoon is um, Senate Bill uh, 532, Senator Kramer. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Finance Committee. Uh, Kramer to introduce Senate Bill 532, uh, which deals with regulating and licensing uh, sales-based financing products. Um, these transactions are not currently regulated by Maryland law. And colleagues, hopefully this legislation will sound somewhat familiar to you. As I introduced legislation last year on the same subject, um, I have had some conversations with representatives of the industry, and there has been some limited meeting of the minds, predominantly um, around the idea of regulating the industry rather than prohibiting the industry. But the regulating part is where we are going to have to agree to disagree. Um, Last year's legislation that I brought to the committee would have prohibited, prohibited merchant cash advances in Maryland. Um, merchant cash advances are just one type of sales-based financing. Um, the industry uh, made their case that they believe there is a market for this kind of financing in Maryland. And those folks who have, are concerned about the predatory nature of this industry and I accepted the notion that, all right, maybe there is a place for it if it is properly licensed and regulated. So the legislation before you this year does not prohibit the practice. 
It regulates and licenses, ju not just merchant cash advances, but all forms of sales-based cash advances um, and other similar, pardon me, online financing, <coughs> which is also referred to as FinTech lending. The bill is limited in its scope to financing in amounts of $500,000 or less. The reason for this is that we are looking to protect small businesses in the state, mom and pop businesses in the state. This is not about Martin Marietta or Lockheed Martin or Marriott. This is about our small mom and pop businesses. And currently, there is no regulation of this industry, and it is the Wild West. So the way these deals work is that in exchange for an amount of money, let's say it's $100,000, the online lender agrees to sell that small business $100,000 and the small business obligates itself to pay back that $100,000 and another $100,000 on top. And what the lender does is they have access to the businesses credit card and bank accounts. And they suck their money every day at the close of business right off the top until their $100,000 is paid back over whatever period of time they've agreed to do it. And the $100,000 interest that they've charged is also paid back. So they consider this a sale. So it is not in their definition a loan and therefore is not governed by federal and state regulations the way banks and credit unions are right now. As the industry grows and flourishes and it has dramatically based on its ability to charge unlimited unlimited interest rates and frequently mislead and fraudulently mischaracterize their financing products, the stories of businesses ruined as a consequence are springing up like mushrooms after a summer storm. Stories of 400% interest rates are more common than not. Stories of aggressive confessions of judgment where Part of the documents that the small business sign allows the lender to go into court and just present the document and claim that the small business has failed to make a payment allows them to seize the assets of the business without the business having any opportunity to go into court or get a lawyer to come in and say, no, wait a minute, this is not accurate. I'm current on my payments. I'm ready to testify. Um, cold calls, aggressive sales tactics with misleading information are hallmarks of the industry and harassing follow-up calls, pushing small business owners to take deals that are too good to be true because they are too good to be true are standard operating procedures of this industry. The industry as a whole is to the mom and pop businesses and merchants what payday loans were to consumers. That is why we banned them in Maryland. But this business, I mean, this bill doesn't ban it. License and regulate. Businesses begin a death spiral as their profits are sucked off the top by the FinTech lenders that are connected, connected directly to their bank accounts. The Federal Reserve conducted a study which has raised significant red flags and alarms about this industry and its frightening and dangerous practices. Bloomberg 
has had a months and months long ongoing investigation about vulnerable and unsuspecting businesses being destroyed due to the predatory practices of these lenders. And in their most recent chapter, Bloomberg offered the following about one of the uh, small businesses that they interviewed. And they say, the company advanced the business a total of $250,000. The business paid back more than $600,000 and the company still, still seized their assets and put them out of business. It is imperative that we act this session to implement the protections in this bill. With the exception of the rate cap, which I will discuss in greater detail as we go along, the bill before you right now matches what has been done in California, the fourth largest economy on planet Earth, and in New York. California and New York have adopted these regulations. Much of the language of this bill has been lifted verbatim from the New York law including annual percentage rate requirements, estimates of an annual percentage rate. The industry will be whining to you all about how it is not possible to do a, an estimated APR. Well, it is possible. And if the industry wants to sell its products in California and New York, they will be providing an estimated APR to the businesses that they are profiting from. And the reason New York and California are requiring this is so that the small business owners will have a better idea of what it is that they are signing and what they're going to be paying and obligating themselves to. So what's in the bill? It's not a whole lot. The first 20 pages uh, deal with, number one, the licensing regime. And that will come under the Office of the Commissioner of Financial Regulation, when that office is intimately familiar with the language of this bill. Uh, they have been very involved during the interim uh, in working through this language. Number two in the bill, is the required estimated APR that I just made mention to. And it comes straight out of what New York has already passed into law. So when they tell you it can't be done, it can be done. Uh, number three, disclosures. What kind of disclosures? It's pretty simple stuff the total amount of the funds provided, the estimated annual percentage rate, the term of the loan, the method, frequency, and amount of payments, fees that will be charged that may not be currently disclosed, a copy of the transaction documents to the small business owner, and a description of collateral requirements. Number four, the bill would prohibit the use of confessions of judgment. And you're gonna have some of these folks in the industry today say, no, we don't use these. And that's great. If it's part of their business model not to use confessed judgment, that's great. But there are too many in the industry as a whole that do use confessions of judgment. Finally, um, that the and this is different. I'm gonna be 100% upfront with the committee about this. The bill establishes a rate cap. Um, in the bill currently, it says 24%. There is an amendment, and I will discuss that a little bit further, that will allow up to 36% interest. And this is going to be a policy decision committee. At what point is it too much? Is 100% too much? Is 300% too much? 
is 400% too much interest. That's going to be a policy committee. Currently, no state has a cap. In this bill, it, as a, if adopted with the amendment, the cap will be 36% interest. And I welcome the opportunity, Madam Chair, when the committee takes the bill up for a vote to discuss the rate cap. And if we think it is in fact appropriate to put a cap on the usurious interest that is currently being charged right now. So I mentioned that there are going to be amendments. In fact, there are two, one of which the committee has already received. It clarifies a bill drafting error that the bill applies to commercial lending. And number two, uh, the uh, amendment that will be coming as a consequence of the bill hearing on the House side will adopt in full the New York regulations governing all of this online lending. And, uh, and it also, there is a um, from the Attorney General's office indicating that they felt they should not have a role to play in this legislation. So in the uh, second amendment that I mentioned, the Attorney General's office will be taken out of the legislation and all of it will rest entirely uh, within the Commissioner of Financial Regulations office. With that, Madam Chair, I thank you all very much. Um, we have uh, the lead off witness, Mr. Uh, Kaditz Peck, is someone who is intimately familiar with this industry because he's been in it and he knows how important it is to do exactly what is in the bill before you because he had to compete with the bad actors. And, uh, and he knows how important it is to put these regulations into place so that legitimate, honest, fair uh, folks in this industry will be the ones competing, not the bad actors. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there questions of the sponsor? Okay. Then we're going to your lead witness, who is Norris Cadiz Peck. You have five minutes. All other witnesses will have two and a half. Thank you so much. Um, Senator Kramer, thank you so much for that introduction. And, and senators, I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Lewis Cadiz Peck. I'm the director of public policy at Lending Club. Lending Club is a fintech company uh, and we're also a bank. Over the last decade, we've facilitated about one and a half billion dollars in loans to borrowers in Maryland. Um, I launched Lending Club's small business lending program in 2014 to offer lower cost, transparent loans to businesses underserved by banks. And we soon saw that small businesses struggle to access capital has really changed. Um, small businesses um, are now inundated with offers of capital often from high cost financing companies that don't transparently disclose the rates they'll charge. Um, committee, I'm gonna apologize. My video doesn't seem to be working, but I've joined for video um, on my cell phone. Uh, I can switch the sound to that if that makes it easier to follow, um, but I'm, my video is elsewhere. Um, so it, it's really easy actually to imagine yourself facing the kind of situation that a small business is in that, that the Senator described. If you needed capital, would you take financing from a company offering a 15% purchase percentage or a loan with a 20% APR? It might not be clear, but would it help to know if, the, if, if you were told that the first option has an APR of 120%? Without this bill, you would likely never be told that. Predatory lending is taking down small businesses in your districts. I, I spoke yesterday to a woman named Cara DePietro CEO of a company in Senator Guzzone's district. I don't know if she's a relation to, to Chris on the call. Um, they build commercial interiors, including for Johns Hopkins and for the US Capitol. She is a savvy businesswoman. Uh, Ms. DePietro was named Maryland Small Business Owner of the Year by the SBA. And she told me that when she took a new round of financing, the contracts initially, they seemed clear. It seemed like they told her everything they were supposed to, but they turned into a whack-a-mole of lies. 
a series of interrelated financing companies hooked her first by sending less money than they told her they were going to send. And then as she tried to get the full amount, they pulled her through this goose chase of refinances, adding fees each time. There are industry words for these kinds of practices. The contract focused on an initially on a price of 10%. That was not actually the APR. Her lawyers later figured out that the APR was 200% and included these confessions of judgment that the Senator described. Uh, at the end of the day, this cost her hundreds of thousands of dollars of business, and the company just spent three years in survival mode, just trying to stay afloat, fighting off these predatory lenders, instead of growing and creating jobs in Maryland. Um, as the Senator described, I work with the legislatures in California and New York to pass the small business truth and lending laws uh, on which Senate Bill 532 is largely based. Those laws passed with overwhelming bipartisan support very broad support from the small business community, nonprofit advocacy, and industry. Everyone agreed that small businesses just deserve to be told the price they're gonna pay in a transparent way. Federal Reserve research has found in at least four different research studies that small businesses today are often misled towards higher cost financing with pricing metrics used in the market today that are not transparent sufficiently. The Fed specifically describes merchant cash advance at, with the words, potentially higher cost, less transparent credit product. Those are the Federal Reserve researchers' words, not mine. They also found that black and Hispanic owned businesses are twice as affected by these higher cost, less transparent credit products. So why does the Federal Reserve research and California and New York and now Maryland all agree that APR is the standard for transparent disclosure rather than some other metric? Uh, it's because APR is the only metric that enables apples to apples comparisons of products of different types, amounts, and lengths. It's the standard embedded over 50 years of the Truth in Lending Act. Um, as the Senator described, you might hear opposition um, saying that they can't estimate an APR. Um, in fact, providers of this kind of financing already do estimate and disclose APRs. To calculate APR, whatever the form of financing, companies can use the formula that's in the Federal Truth in Lending Act, it's algebra. You plug in how much money you get and how much money you pay back and when, and it spits out an APR. For sales-based financing, you have to plug in some estimates and these companies have the estimates. Financing companies don't give away money with no expectation of when that money is gonna come back to them. SB 532 provides two methods to guide these estimations to make sure there's no funny business, um, but also it's flexible. This is the same approach that New York and California took. Some companies with high APRs may argue that APR is not a helpful disclosure and that quoting cost in just dollar amount should be enough. Like, why isn't it enough to just to tell you that the fee is gonna be $10,000? It's because that does not allow you to make a comparison between financing of different amounts and different lengths. To, to just to quickly illustrate before I close, consider you're renting a house for $10,000. Is that a good deal? You need to know how long you get to use that house for $10,000. Paying $10,000 for six months of a house or financing is more expensive than paying $10,000 for five years. What's the all-in cost per year? That's what the APR tells you. I urge you to advance Senate Bill 532 with the amendments that the Senator described. Small businesses are really depending on it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of this witness? Senator Feldman. Yeah, just um, I apologize because I don't have access right now of the, yes. the testimony, but so Lewis, just so I'm clear, because I heard a couple different things and I just want to make sure I got the facts and probably could ask Senator Kramer, but okay, I understand the disclosure. So just back on the New York, California uh, laws, which Senator Kramer mentioned this bill's modeled up. So I understand about the disclosure, just so I'm clear. So do those, those particular states have caps, uh, like this one on APR, and this bill is 24%. Because I heard you talk a lot about disclosures and disclosing what the deal is, but you didn't mention those states having a, a specific uh, APR cap. Maybe I missed it, and I don't have right. a this testimony. So I'm not, right. it's, not a, it's not a catch a thing. Catch a thing. I just want to make sure I understand New York and California relative to this bill. Yeah, thank you for highlighting that. Those bills did not include a rate cap. And as the Senator pointed out, that's a really important public policy dis decision and, and frankly, a complicated one to consider. Okay, that, that's really a pretty specific. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Senator Feldman, I did sure. by when I 
introduce that we do not have this makes us unique if we were to adopt this okay, okay. That, uh, i just wanted to make sure i, I heard it accurately right Thank, thanks a lot okay senator jennings thank you madam chair um so lewis you're with the lending club that's correct so it, my question is so you say you don't do these types of loans but you do lend in maryland Correct. That's correct. When I say we don't do these types of loans, I'm referring to merchant cash advances. We offer other loan products. So what I see is most people that are going to use these are businesses that are truly suffering and are probably on the teeter of going out. And this is kind of a Hail Mary pass that some of them are going to throw to, to try to save their business, which is a lot of risk to the lender. So my question to you is, do you have a product that you could offer one of these businesses that knowing that going into this, that your probability of getting paid back is going to be very limited because of, you know, the, the business really isn't in good shape. I mean, I'm trying to figure out what, what the industry would offer yeah. to customers. Yeah, Senator, um, yes, we do. Uh, yes, we do. There, um, uh, the, the small business financing we offer um, is also focused on underserved small businesses. Um, it sees five times the representation of minority owned small businesses as compared to traditional banking. There is a risk spectrum here. And so I, I don't want to, you know, delude you that there, there's a point where a, a business is really, really risky and, and hard to lend to. Um, and much of this industry is focused on that segment of the market. And I think a question is, are they focused on that in a way with where A, the small business knows what they're getting into. They have transparency in the document so that they are making an informed choice that yes, they're making a Hail Mary pass where they know they're gonna pay a 400% APR to try to resurrect their business. And second, are the products being offered by this industry offered in a way where there's oversight by the regulator so that when they try to run a scam like they did on Ms. DePietro's business, that there's someone who can help, um, help hold that scam to account. And third, I think you would consider, are the products at a certain level actually structured in a way that can, that can help a business? Um, I think that, with the way that the senators described, um, this bill would help on all accounts. All right, and then my last question, um, doing research on this was dealt with uh, accounts receivable factoring. Could you consider this factoring for receivables that you're getting paid in advance for future sales? I'm just trying to figure out what the difference between this and what factoring is, because yeah. research, I went down a whole different rabbit hole. Sure, um, so legally, uh, Merchant cash advance products like to associate themselves with factoring from a legal perspective. From the perspective of the business, the products are, are, are really pretty different. If you're using factoring, you actually have an invoice that okay. you're trying to get paid on. And when you get paid on it, that's the end of the transaction for you. You got paid, the factor collects on the invoice. Um, and that's really short-term financing. That's like 30, 60 days, maybe 90 days, typically. Um, okay. in, in merchant cash advance, you don't have an invoice and it's, it's really much more like a loan, albeit the, except that the payment is variable. Um, you're getting money and then you're repaying it in the future over time. It tends to be, the, the terms on these tend to be six to 18 months. Um, and they tend to be used by different classes of business to some extent. So, um, one thing that the bill does very well to your question, Senator, is that it, it kind of, it, it just avoids a lot of the legal mucky muck of whether you call these things, um, whether you call merchant cash advance a loan or not. Um, that's a hot issue. It's a legal issue that's really important to companies that don't want to be covered by lending law. And your bill basically stays out of, this bill stays out of that fight by using this term sales-based financing. So it doesn't really opine on whether this stuff is a loan or not a loan. It just says, Whatever it is, it's financing. And if it's financing, we think a small business should be able to go into it informed with their eyes wide open, able to make an apples to apples comparison of the cost. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there other uh, questions for this witness? All right, we're going next to Kaylee Locklear. Good afternoon, honorable members of the committee. Kaylee Locklear here on behalf of the Maryland Retailers Association. Last year, the legislation introduced, as you've heard, was an outright ban on these types of loan products. Very clearly, we heard from industry and even some concerns on this committee. 
that we should be regulating them instead, which is the bill we are here in support of and presenting to you today. I draw your attention to the massive reporting series Bloomberg's Business Week has released in your written testimony with story after story about the problems with sales-based financing companies and their very predatory nature. They are now one of the most visible and well-marketed lending products and businesses are suckered in, completely unclear about what they're getting themselves into with quick and easy cash. But the sick reality is that they can end up paying back in upwards of 450% in interest with massive upfront fees. You heard what the bill does from the sponsor, but I just want to hit on two important areas. A cap is incredibly important as the interest rates these unregulated companies are getting away with is flat out criminal. What it does, Senator Jennings, to your points earlier, is it traps a small business in a cycle of debt they will never escape with many actually having to take out another advance just to try to cover that first. And then I'll point to banning confessions of judgment, and it's also highly important. Before borrowers get a loan, they have to sign a statement giving up their right to defend themselves if a lender takes them to court. It's like an arbitration agreement, except the borrower always loses. Armed with a confession, a lender can, without proof, and you heard this earlier, accuse borrowers of not paying and legally seize their assets before they've even known what happened. In dozens of interviews and court pleadings, borrowers describe lenders who forged documents, lied about how much they were owed, or fabricated defaults out of thin air. Finally, many of these online lenders have intentionally done anything and everything they can to kill these bills, not the narrative that you're about to hear from many of them. Again, New York and California have moved very similar legislation with regulations that are rolling out shortly. And finally, even the FTC is stepping in at the federal level. We urge Maryland to do the same and I'm glad to answer any questions. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay. We're going next to Robert Enton, Maryland Bankers Association. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman, members of the committee, Robert Enton on behalf of the uh, Maryland Bankers Association and uh, on behalf of our banks all over the state of Maryland, we'd like to thank Senator Kramer uh, for sponsoring uh, what we think is important legislation. The, um, uh, I'm not gonna repeat what the other witnesses have said. I think what I'd like to do is to call the committee's attention uh, and you can find it online, and uh, I'll be happy to send the link. Uh, in December of 2019, uh, the United States Federal Reserve Bank did a study on online lending. It's a lengthy document. It's a 36-page uh, single-space document, uh, but it has some important things in it. What they did is they convened two different study groups with 80 small businesses in each study group. And they met and they discussed this and they went through it. And um, what they determined, and I'm going to quote from the, uh, the study, the uh, businesses said, quote, it is difficult to compare when they are using different models and different terminology. Quote, they don't like to use the word interest and they dress it up in other ways to conceal the real cost of the loan. Unquote. Quote. I don't know what a factor rate is. Quote, full disclosure, like on credit cards or mortgages, it's what's necessary. They need to state the actual APR, unquote. When you go down and scroll down further in the study, they took an example, it says table three represents APR equivalents for a common scenario in which $50,000 is repaid in six months according to the terms and rates promoted on the lender's site. So one of them advertised on the site a 1.15 factor rate, whatever that means. The estimated APR for that loan was approximately 70%. One of them quoted a 4% fee rate, whatever that means. That was approximately a 45% APR. Another one quoted 9% simple interest but when you calculated the APR, it was 46%. Um, they quote that many of these loans ends up, depending on when they're repaid, in triple figures if you put it into an APR. 
Uh, so we support the legislation. Uh, our members uh, uh, do not make these loans. I don't believe they will ever make these loans. They make traditional business loans. You get a note, it has a rate of interest. There's an APR. You repay it over ever how many months you're going to repay it. And you can say, I went to this bank and they gave quoted me this rate. And I went to this bank and they quoted me that rate. And they can compare what the rates are. Um, and as you've often heard me say, there's no industry, I don't believe anywhere in the state of Maryland or in the country that's as heavily regulated as the banking industry at the state and federal level. So thank you very much. We urge the committee to give the bill a favorable report. Okay, Senator Bottle has a question for you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Enton. So my question isn't that I oppose having a cap on the rate, but as you and I both know, a lot of banks will not loan to these small businesses that don't have the assets. And so this is an option for some of these businesses that really don't have another way to, to achieve mm -hmm. loans. So I'm not sure if we, we need to find a middle ground somewhere so these small businesses can continue to get the money they need you know, when oh, they no. need it. Let me just say, uh, uh, Senator Biden, I'll be happy to sit down with you and show you the actual statistics and the programs that Maryland banks are doing for small business lending. Once again, we're very heavily regulated and uh, we have to comply with um, a myriad of federal and state regulations. But we, we are supporting a number of bills this year, both in the Senate and in the House, to facilitate small business lending. It is a top priority for the banking industry. I think the real question here and the challenge is, you know, can you come up with something, and other states have, and the Federal Reserve seems to think you can, to establish something that small businesses can use to compare this transaction to another transaction, and not all the small business lenders use the same, uh, online lenders use the same terms. They use a whole variety of terms. We need a consistent term that people can compare. And then the question I guess you have to answer is what is an appropriate cap for these transactions? So, but I'd be happy to sit down and uh, uh, with, with our staff at the MBA and uh, show you exactly, and anybody else on the committee, what we're doing in the, in the world of small business lending. So these uh, online lenders have ethereal terms. They just uh, you can't pin them down as to what the terms are. And the average person who's unsophisticated and trying to make the loan, no matter how bad off they are, doesn't want to end up worse off. And very often they're going to be under the, this scenario. Agreed. Okay, are there other questions? Senator, Senator Reedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think my question is maybe for Bob. Um, I, th I think so. Um, in the bill, we, it talks about a limit on you have to have a certain amount of money available uh, as liquid capital. I, I, I guess um, I'm, I'm curious. You can't go get a loan from a bank without some level of capital, usually, correct? I mean, that, that, not a commercial loan. To, to help you, correct? I mean, you, your, your clients would not, that's my experience. I mean, am I correct in saying that? Well, I think, you know, once again, um, uh, uh, we're, we're required by both federal and state regulators uh, to make sure that we properly evaluate a borrower's ability to repay. And part of that ability to repay, just like when you apply for a mortgage, they want to know how much money do you have in the bank? What is your income? What assets do you have? Because they're lending out their depositors money and they, and, and they are, are obligated to make sure that um, uh, that depositors money is repaid to the bank. So it yes, isn't part no. of, but, but don't we, at times a, a business will go get a loan on the potential of what they're going to be able to do. Correct. I mean, it can't just be potential usually, but, uh, it, it, what, what's the difference? I, and I look, it, it's clear to me looking at some of the things here, obviously there's some issues with this. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that anybody, that everybody engaged in this, this practice is, is doing the right thing. Um, at, you know, but aren't we at times, I mean, are, are we, would it be wrong to just try to get rid of this entirely? Because it sounds like we're trying to basically say you, you can't do it unless you have a certain amount of capital available. 
No, I think what I, I think what what we're trying to say, and what Senator Kramer is trying to say, and what they've said in other states, is we want some consistency, you know, in in the terms, so that borrowers, you know, can, you know, I, I don't know what a factor rate is, a fee rate is, so the borrowers can can look at it and and comparison shop, and maybe they can get a better deal from this online lender versus that online lender. But it's it's not apples and oranges. It's all apples when they compare. I think in your industry and with banks as well. I think the the other issue really is, you know, is I think you have to decide, you know, uh, you know, is should there be a cap, whatever amount that is? um, And um, uh, should they be you know regulated? I think that the uh, uh, opponents or whether signed up favorable to amendments or not, I don't know, are not necessarily objecting to being regulated. Uh, I don't know that they're necessarily objecting to uh, having an APR. Um, I know they object to having uh, any cap at all. And uh, I see Chris DiPietro nodding his head. Uh, the, uh, uh, but, um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, we need to have a discussion about, you know, how, how should this industry be, be regulated? And well, I think that's fair. Reading. I just I feel like uh, my, my my impression from the hearings is that we we think they really are just you know bad and shouldn't exist. I, I mean, a glossary of terms makes sense to me. I I, so I I just am concerned about. Look, I don't think it's right that people can go in and get a loan on their credit card at Walmart, you know. But I, and that's a terrible financial <laughs> habit to get into. But we don't make it illegal. So, uh, um. But there are terms. I get the point about terms, certainly, and being able to compare apples and apples. There's terms that those people can find out what the term is. But thank you, I'm, Senator Reedy. If I can quickly uh, clarify, I think what well, you're looking now, at. Wait a minute, Yeah, no. He asked this question about this need to have certain assets. This is not the business that has to have the assets. The business looking to get the loan. These okay. are the requirements of the financial institution making the loan. So that Madam Chair, that needed to be clarified. I misread I that. Thank you. Yep. Okay. And and Bob and, and and Mr. Sponsor, would you agree? Some people are in such bad shape. Any loan that they would get will put them in worse shape. There are times when you're in extreme unction. Then there are other people that could get a loan, but they need to really understand the terms. And not only to, to understand them orally, it ought to be down in writing with the imprimatur of the entity that is offering the loan so you can uh, have something to hold on to. If you, if, and you're if, absolutely correct. Yes, that is correct. If I could, Madam Chair, just very quickly, just, you know, I, I would really urge you to look at the, the Federal Reserve study because that, that's not one side or the other, that's the Federal Reserve. And the three examples that they give, the APR on one was 70%, the APR on the other was 45%, the APR on another is 46%. No bank is charging for uh, APR 46% or 70%, that I can tell you. Okay. And Bob, you're going to get me that Federal Reserve. Yes, ma'am. I'll send it to every Thank member you. of the committee with the link. Okay. Thank I see you. Senator Augustine smiling. You can't wait to read it. I know. Okay. Well, me too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's go uh, next to where, where was it? Robin McKinney. Yeah, Robin McKinney. Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, my name is Robin McKinney. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the Cash Campaign of Maryland. Cash stands for Creating Assets, Savings, and Hope, and we help low to moderate income individuals and families to be more uh, financially secure here in strong support of Senate Bill 532. This committee well knows, and has anyone who's been around for a while has seen me in this committee a lot, talking about access to capital at what cost. And that's really what this bill comes down to for me, is that at the end of the day, yes, people need access to money, but if that money puts them in a worse financial situation, then we need to put more guardrails around it. And that is really what Senate Bill 532 does, is it puts guardrails around a current system that is unregulated, and as you've heard, has a very range of impacts. Um, We've seen a lot of it, particularly on small businesses. I do want to mention that we are seeing from our partners a targeting of Black and Latino businesses in Prince George's and Montgomery County, people going door to door 
per, asking for you know people to take out these loans, folks that are getting in way over their head, not understanding the set of terms or the terms actually changing. Um, we have talked about online lending, which is a great opportunity for a lot of businesses and, and people to access capital. But if it's expensive, if it's having a disparate impact on Black and Latino businesses, then it, we need to put, again, some guardrails. Personally, at the uh, Cash Campaign of Maryland, we have on our website a list of all of our partners, our free tax preparation uh, locations across the state. Cash personally receives um, both marketing in the mail as well as electronically like uh, lead generation emails from a range of these different products, not because of anything that Cash is doing, but on behalf of some of our businesses. And I will tell you, they are all either rural businesses black owned or Latino owned businesses. So we at cash are being particularly targeted for us to take out these loans for these businesses that aren't even our business. We just happen to offer a service there. Um, so we are definitely seeing as a problem. Um, the last thing I just wanna mention is the importance of disclosure, putting out all of the terms is very important, but that timing of the disclosure is very key that it's before someone has signed on the dotted line that they really understand everything that they're getting into. And just to close with where I started with the cost of capital. This committee and the General Assembly has long stated on the personal lending side that our usury cap of 33% is enough for these smaller dollar loans. And so as we think about a cap and considering what a cost of capital can do for a small business, especially in these economic times, we ask that you remember that and urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 532. Okay, any uh, questions for this witness? Okay, we're going next to Chris DePietro. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Chris DePietro. I'm here on behalf of Fiserv. Fiserv is a global financial services company, is probably one of the leading payment processors in the world. Um, we are here favorable with amendment. I think 95% uh, of what Senator Kramer described in his opening statement about the bill uh, will be addressed with all the issues that we support about this bill. Um, we have offered, we, we're offering amendments. We will get them to committee council. I, I believe the proponents of the bill have a copy of our amendments already. Um, but let me just talk about a few things. We fully support licensing. I think that's the key. The commissioner of financial regulation has to know what the landscape is of the companies that are doing this type of product. That's number one. Um, the estimated APR, there was a lot of talk about that. Yes. New York and California require an estimated APR. We're doing business in those states, but let me be clear, the rules and regulations related to estimated APR have not been promulgated yet. Whatever they happen to be, our company will, will comply with that. And if that's the case in Maryland and you choose to go down this road, we will comply with those regulations as well. We fully uh, agree that disclosure has to be a part of the issue. And on um, the, the uh, uh, confessions of judgments, we never did that anyway. So we are full support of that. Where we draw the issue, and I wanna focus most of my time on this, is the, is the cap on the APR. The other two states, as they, everybody has said already, do not have the cap. I, I, I argue this, if you include a cap, I think it's gonna get rid of most of this, this industry in this availability of this product in the state of Maryland. So it will basically have the effect of the bill that Senator Kramer introduced last year. So I think Senator Beidel was spot on a little bit earlier when she says, if companies cannot get this type of uh, availability of capital, they're gonna be forced to go into the traditional lending, commercial lending market. I know a little bit about this because before I was a lobbyist in Annapolis, I was a commercial lender for a major financial institution for 10 years. They do not make loans unless there is uh, collateral on that loan. And they do not make uh, loans to businesses unless there's a personal guarantee and there's a net worth sufficient to cover the extension of the credit. If you fall into that bucket, which many small businesses do, you're not gonna. You're not gonna get capital from a bank. Like Bob Enton said, there's there's uh, you're lending a depositor's money out. There's stronger regulations and rules that apply to that, and there should be. 
So I think you need to consider that. Senator Jennings talked a little bit earlier about these are people that are teetering on the edge and that they're gonna, you know, they're on their way up, you know, might their businesses might fail. Two things I want you to understand. In our model, we only, uh, you know, the Clover system, you've probably seen it in, in merchants that you frequent in your neighborhood. It's a very popular piece of hardware that merchants use to process payments um, credit and debit payments through their, their, their businesses. We only advance this type of capital to people that we do business with uh, through the uh, Clover product. So we're not out there, like Ms. McKinney said, knocking on doors, trying to sell these products to individuals that we don't have a relationship with. We do that also because we know how that, the, what the business flow is of that business because we see their daily receipts. So we know what their highs and lows are and we have a good sense of how they're gonna be able to repay that. And I think, I think it's key, a lot of people, a lot of small businesses use this to finance the ups and downs of their business cycle. If you are a heavily Christmas oriented uh, a company and you're selling things at Christmas time, you might need one of these loans in August to buy your, your inventory, but you'll know you'll be able to repay it back. The issue with the APR is that if you put a cap on it, even with all due respect to the sponsor, even at 36%, we'll, we'll basically eliminate this product, at least from our perspective, from the Maryland market. So I really urge uh, caution and not moving in that direction. Um, I, I think we're 95% we're in alignment with the intent of the sponsor and the Maryland Retailers Association. We've met with them multiple times over the interim. I hope we can work this out. We've worked other issues out with them before, as this committee well knows. So we're here to do that. Um, Kim Ford from Fiserv is going to follow behind me, and she's going to talk a little bit more about the detail of actually how these transactions work to clear up, I think, some of the misconceptions um, uh, or blanket statements about how all they all work. But I'm happy to answer any questions in the meantime. Uh, Chris, would you say some of these businesses though are so fragile and had somebody taken out one of these uh, just before the pandemic started last year and they knew what they, they were getting it for the Thanksgiving or Christmas season, they did in the water. Before. That, that could be true, Senator. That could be true, Madam Chair. But but I think, that, and you might hear a story later that we heard in the House hearing of a company, not ours, and I'll let them explain it because it's their story. But it, they they took on one of these advances right before the pandemic, and they their business went to zero. And the company didn't say, okay, you still owe us, you still owe us for, you know, pushing judgments on they, they, the reputable companies will, will put this on hold. And I, as far as I, and Kim can explain this, we do not pursue these transactions in court for judgment if they are not able to repay. That's our policy the, for the our company. The thing though, Chris, is that when you're talking about online, you could be dealing with somebody in your locker. You don't know who in the oh, heck you're dealing with as well. Well, as and that could be true. Be. And I think that's where the regulation comes in. And that's where the commissioner comes in. That's not the case for us. You know, we're, we're um, a U.S.-based company uh, with worldwide reach. Um, you know, we have uh, over 2,000 um, employees in the state of Maryland in Hagerstown. Um, our, I, Kim can talk more about this. Our average loan amount or advance amount, I should say, is 18,800 in Maryland. That's our average. And okay. the fee would never go over $5,200. And that's at the very high end. Most are going to be much lower than that. So the problem with the estimated APR, I'm not saying we're opposed to estimating the APR, but it's, it's, a, it's a moving target. It depends on how well the business is doing because they decide up front, well, I want to be aggressive and pay this back, this back quickly. So I'm going to authorize you to take out 20% of my receipts every day, that which would be aggressive. Other businesses say, I can't afford to do that. Only take 5% out. And, you know, we, that, that's just, you know, how the flexibility of the product for the customer. So when you, when you are very, very needy. Yes. And not all that sophisticated, you're likely to be overly optimistic about what you can do and how you can. 
And, and I'm sure there, for lack of a better word, is an underwriting process that uh, Pfizer undergoes to before they actually make a decision. I don't think we just give this to anybody. So I think okay. Kim can talk a little bit about that and how it works. We're going to Kim for it right now, and you have two and a half. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, members of the committee. I am Kim Ford, SVP of Government Relations with Fiserv. Again, as Chris said, we're here as a favorable with amendment position. Uh, Chris covered a lot of the points, um, you know, but just to emphasize a few things. So again, we are not an online lender. We're, we're a payment processing company. We set up the Clover Capital Program, which is a merchant cash advance program just a couple of years ago in direct response to requests that we were getting from our business clients. So our businesses were we're saying there are times where we need money. We're not able to get a bank loan for whatever reason. And, you know, would this be something that you would be willing to set up? So the way that it works with our program, again, you have to be a Clover customer, uh, an existing customer of Fiserv. And, um, you know, the business comes to us with, they essentially apply for a funding amount. And then what we do is we look at their historical debit and credit card transactions. So if they've been a customer of ours for a year, we will look at that year. If they've been in business with us less than a year, we'll look less than a year. So we look at those credit and debit card transactions and we come up with an amount that we think is, is appropriate based on the volume of transactions that they're getting on a daily base, basis. So we come up with a percentage that that uh, business will pay us back every day based on those debit and credit transactions. So again, that's going to fluctuate based on how well they're doing. If they are not not bringing in money, we do not get that merchant cash advance paid. So they pay us when they get paid. And it's a percentage of their daily transactions. It's never going to be 100%. They're never going to not be able to put money in the bank because they were paying their merchant cash advance back. And as Chris said, um, you know, we do not do confessions of judgment. Um, this is actually Fiserv's money that we're sending out. It's not, it's not a bank that we're borrowing from to pay our business. And so if that business were to go out of business, we take that merchant cash advance as a loss. That's just money that comes out of our pocket. Um, you know, when we have a, a statement, the agreement that the, that the business signs, um, we state very clearly on that front of the agreement what the purchase price is, how much the business will receive, how much the agreement will actually cost them, and then the total repayment amount. Uh, again, we are very comfortable with the uh, disclosures, especially if we can conform those to New York. We're, we're comfortable with the licensing. It's really the cap that we struggle with. And again, I think part of that challenge is when you look at an APR, that's generally a 12-month, you know, monthly type of payment over the course of a year, whereas these products are generally paid back in six months or less. And so, you know, when you when you apply a, a cap to that type of product, it's kind of of apples and oranges. It skews the economics quite a bit. And I think the other piece that I'll just say before I close about having a cap is, again, if the business is doing well, they may elect to pay more on that merchant cash advance so that they can just be done with it. And a cap would actually prevent that from happening. Uh, because again, if they bring in, you know, 10% of maybe 100,000 in revenue is a different amount than 10% of $1,000 in revenue. And so, you know, if, if you're subject to a cap and that business wants to actually do you okay. this faster payment, it's going to be difficult. Thank you. Let me just say this. As I listen, and I'm trying to be very open-minded, I believe you're running a legitimate business. I know for, I've known mm -hmm. for years and all, but you have one business. And 99% of the Marylanders who find themselves needing to uh, go to market to look for a cash uh, infusion won't necessarily find any one company. We want, we need something that can be there no matter where they go. And because you are also online and uh, I, you can lend to people in other states, there's nothing that would stop you under the terms of other states from doing what you do. We need to know that the 99% of small businesses who are gonna get into trouble and who need uh, transparency, they need regulations, <laughs> uh, they need uh, uh, to know up front uh, uh, what they will owe and that it is solid, uh, need to have the regulatory uh, help 
that the bill basically is laying out. I don't we think support it, that, Madam Chair. We support that. I don't that, think it uh, means it, anything against what you're doing, but yeah. because not everybody's going to find your one company. And a lot of them would still end up if we were to say, well, your company is the model and is sufficient and we don't need to do these other things. Uh, we'd have a lot more people still in trouble. So that, again, that's just to be clear, we support everything about the bill except the cap. That's the only thing we don't support. Okay. So we agree with you, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, all right. Who, who, Senator, Kramer. Senator Kramer. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Kim and Chris, uh, I, first of all, I want to say thank you. Um, you both have been very upfront in trying to work through uh, the regulations to, to get this bill uh, in a posture where you would feel comfortable supporting it. And, and I do acknowledge that, look, your business model, I don't think there's a lot of concern with, as the chair was pointing out. But we're dealing with everyone in this industry that doesn't necessarily share your business model. So I, I get it. You support the bill in its entirety with one piece, and that's the cap. So let me ask you this, because as I stated in my introduction of the bill, I think this is a policy decision that the committee will need to take up at a voting session. But is there any point where you believe it's not too much? In other words, is 100% interest okay? Is 200%, 300? Is there a point where you would right. say, all right, look, we get it. It's too much. Yeah, Senator, I wish I wish we could simply answer that question. I agree with you 100. I wish we could answer that question. But the variables for this type of product, because what you're talking about is a, a fixed amount that we're that we're advancing to the merchant, and then there's a fixed amount for the fee for that advance. So the APR all depends on how quickly or how slowly they repay okay, that loan. So, yeah, so we are going to be in a gotcha that. situation. If you put too low of a cap on there, we're going to be in a gotcha situation and we're not going to be compliant with the law. If we can't be compliant with the law with the cap, we're not going to make these types of advances in Maryland. Okay. That's the bottom line. Okay. okay, we have several unfavorables and we need to hear those witnesses also. Uh, let's go to Chris Grimm, Innovation Lending Platform Association. Madam Chair, we have two and a half minutes. Chris Grimm with Innovative Lending Platform Association. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Mr. Grimm, are you unmuted? I am. Mr. Grimm, I, I see your mouth moving, but we can't hear you. How about now? Does that work? Yes. Yes. Technology. Uh, Chris Grimm, Innovative uh, Lending Platform Association. Uh, our position is very similar to Fiserv's. Uh, we fully support disclosure. We were um, in the driver's seat for a long time in New York, along with uh, Lewis and the Responsible Business Lending Coalition on the bill that passed there. We fully supported it. We worked very closely with business advocacy groups, with the sponsors, uh, to craft what we feel is uh, sort of the gold standard model legislation uh, for, for small business finance regulation. Uh, like Pfizer, we do have to oppose this bill because of the cap. Uh, I just want to make a few, a few quick points. Um, there is absolutely a place in the market for these products, uh, as I think has been mentioned earlier. Um, banks are not filling the credit need of, of Maryland small businesses. Uh, for businesses that are not as established, um, do not have collateral, do not have large cash assets. Um, this is a way for them to get financing uh, in return for a payment of uh, a percentage of their future sales. Uh, I always equate this more to taking on an investor um, where they're giving you uh, a, a, a um, they're providing you with cash uh, and in return, they're getting a piece of your business. Um, but with these products, it is just for a, uh, a set amount uh, instead of forever. Um, the cap is tantamount to a ban for two reasons. One, it ignores the economics that I just laid out um, of these products primarily being utilized by companies that either don't have the assets or the collateral or the credit for a traditional bank loan, 
or banks can't serve them fast enough. Uh, my dad owns a pizza place. If his pizza oven breaks, he can't wait two, four, eight weeks uh, for funding, right? You need a quick infusion of cash to invest in your business um, to get back to your business. The other thing that it ignores is the, the time factor. Um, the question of is 100% enough, is 200% enough. If the financing is really short, that percentage goes up dramatically. My dad's pizza oven, if he gets the financing to get a new pizza oven in and business is booming and he pays that financing back in two weeks, that APR may very well be well over 100%. And for those two reasons, that cap is tantamount to a ban. And if you ban this product, what's going to happen, right? The banks are not filling the credit needs of these small businesses. If you ban the people who are, someone mentioned offshore actors. If our members and Fiserv and other quality businesses cannot do this, offshore companies will step in and it'll be much worse for small businesses. Thank you very much. Are there questions for this witness? Okay, we're going next to Patrick Segret, Fred, Rapid Financial Services, LLC. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of this committee. My name is Patrick Siegfried. I'm here on behalf of Rapid Financial Services. Rapid was founded in 2006, and we've been headquartered in Montgomery County, Maryland ever since. Uh, to date, we've provided over $2 billion in working capital to small businesses throughout the United States, and we employ nearly 200 employees at our Bethesda office. Uh, our financing products include sales-based financing, which is the subject of 532. Uh, again, this type of financing allows small businesses to sell a portion of their future revenue in exchange for immediate working capital. In a sales-based financing transaction, and I think this is important to, to reiterate, there is no repayment term, interest rate, or set payment amounts. And most importantly, there is no personal guarantee required of the business owner. And again, I, this is, uh, I want to highlight this because this is not what you see when you have a, a loan product or a line of credit product. Uh, with, because there's no personal guarantee, the risk is placed on the funder. Rapid takes the risk of the business slowing down or even failing. And again, I was here last year and I testified to the benefits of sales-based financing. And unfortunately, the COVID pandemic has proven how important it can be to small businesses, especially the lack of a personal guarantee. As many businesses were shut down due to COVID, those businesses with a sales-based financing product were not required to make any payments. Moreover, if those businesses have to shut their doors forever, the business owners will not be reliable for the remaining balance because there's no personal guarantee. And again, this is different than with a loan or light of credit product because with those products, the business owner is still required to make payments under the terms of the transaction throughout COVID. And if the business ultimately failed, the business owners who guarantee those transactions are still liable uh, to the lender for the amounts that need to be repaid. Again, that's not true with a sales-based financing transaction. Nationwide, uh, Rapid has provided uh, or has two, over 290 customers with sales-based financing accounts that experienced decreased revenue as a result of COVID. In the event that these businesses ultimately failed, Rapid would take the loss, a loss of over $9 million. However, the owners of the small businesses would not owe Rapid anything. In Maryland, we've had over uh, 10 customers who were severely impacted by COVID. And in the event these businesses unfortunately do not survive, their business, their business owners will walk away debt free. We are unable to support 532 as it would restrict access to this important type of working capital. Moreover, it would uh, apply the truth, the Federal Truth of Lending Act to a commercial finance product that the act was never meant to cover. Uh, TILA does not provide any guidance or language in applying APR to commercial financing and more specifically to sales-based financing, such as the financing at issue in 532. And again, uh, while I know California and New York has passed some laws related to these products, the regulations implementing those laws have not been finalized. And if ultimately okay. we, uh, so while we oppose 532, we would uh, we were committed to work with this committee and the, the sponsor to create a comprehensive legislation to regulate commercial financing. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, There's one thing, let, let, can I tell you one thing and I'm gonna call it. I just happened to look at the letter from the Attorney General, which is an informational letter they didn't take aside. But let's everybody take a look at the last sentence in paragraph one and the rest of this letter. It comes up with some things that I think might require some amendment. I think there's some unintentional things that maybe happen in drafting and uh, take a look. I won't go further, but uh, I think the, the, the 
bill is solid in its intent and uh, there is a need for regulation. And uh, just take a look at this to see. Ma Madam Chair, if, yeah. if I may, uh, in my introductory remarks, I indicated that there's an amendment coming in response to that letter from the Attorney General. Okay. Take the AG's office completely out of the bill and put everything into the Commissioner of Financial Regulation. Okay. All right. So that's okay. going to be coming to the committee. Yes. Thank you. And I appreciate your pointing that out. Uh, I do have a question for Mr. Siegfried, Madam. And Chief. we got one more witness. You want to hear? The, okay. And, and I suspect I'll have a question for Ms. Fisher as well. Um, but real fast, Mr. Siegfried, uh, obviously you've heard to this evening, you're out of sync with everyone else who has testified this evening with regard to the legislation in that they have all agreed to all aspects of the bill with the exception of the cap. But you made the point of indicating there is no personal guarantee from the owner. So let me ask you this, what, what recourse does your company have if someone stops paying? If they legitimately stop paying because of the business failure, none. No, if they stop paying you, what is the recourse? Well, again, no. Senator, I think you'd misunderstand the product. They don't stop paying. They stop processing credit card transactions. And because they're not cre processing credit card transactions, that means, unfortunately, the business is not doing well. And so again, what is your recourse? We do not have any recourse, Senator. Nothing, again, no this is no the, interest, no recourse with regard to the business assets? To the business assets, correct, yes. Okay, so now we just hit on something very important that you have failed to share with the committee in your testimony, because you said, sir, and I wrote down verbatim, owners walk away debt free. The risk is on the lender. These are direct quotes from you, sir. But the fact of the matter is, you can go in and seize the business bank account, sir. You can go in and seize their assets, their inventory, their fixtures, their <laughs> equipment. You do, in fact, have recourse, sir. So when you represented to this committee, walk away debt free, that really wasn't quite an accurate statement, was it, sir? So, Senator, again, the, the customers are rapid finances. Uh, excuse, sorry, the pun, but they don't have access to banks. They don't. They don't have the. Okay, that's that, not my question for you. Would you like to? Like, would All you like I ask okay. is that you explain that there is in fact recourse and you can seize all the assets of the business. And in fact, sir, last year at the hearing on this bill, we saw the twenty pages of lawsuits that you filed against small business owners because you go after their business assets. Would you like you to seize? You seize everything that they have. So is again, that correct? Senator, Again, Senator, I think you yes. So thank again, you, thank you. The thank business okay, we've candor, got the Mr. one Sick other uh, witness, and we want to hear the last witness. So if we could hear now from Catherine Fisher of Commercial Finance Coalition. Ms. Fisher, I meet you. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. This has been a long afternoon, so thanks for bearing with me to hear my testimony. My name is Kate Fisher. I'm a partner with firm Hudson Cook based in Maryland and I represent the Commercial Finance Coalition, a group of responsible finance companies that provide capital to small and medium-sized businesses. Proponents of this legislation are describing it as allowing small businesses to compare apples to apples so they can understand the cost of financing across products. And the Federal Reserve study that Mr. Enton mentioned and that, that you will be receiving a copy of apparently it is very good. And it says that small businesses need help comparing costs across different types of financing. Respectfully, this legislation does not address that issue. This legislation singles out only one product, sales-based financing. And this product is not a loan. The California and New York legislation that has been referenced has some important differences that I'd like to touch on, but both of those states have addressed disclosures across commercial financing as a whole. It applies to loans, lines of credit, invoice factoring, merchant cash advance, sales-based finance. 
this legislation before you only applies to a very narrow slice of commercial finance and commercial finance is complicated. As a result, this does not provide an opportunity to comparison shop across commercial finance. It would only provide, it would only require one small sliver of the commercial finance world to provide these types of disclosures. California passed a law that will require a rate disclosure. The law does not require an APR disclosure in California. The regulator has been working for two years to draft re regulations that um, have proposed an APR disclosure, but because this issue is so complicated, particularly trying to apply an APR disclosure to sales-based finance, which is not a loan, does not have fixed required payments or a fixed term, um, it, it has proved to be so complex that so far the regulations have not been finalized. New York has proposed an APR disclosure, again, across almost all segments of commercial finance, not just one narrow product. Um, although that law has been passed and it will require an APR disclosure, the regulator will have to flush out uh, a lot of complicated rules in order to require an APR disclosure for this type of product. And I just want to show you as an example of how complicated it is. This is an example of the formula for calculating APR. Uh, it, it, is, it, it is more complex than simply um, calculating the payment amount. Oh, all right. One, one, sorry, may I just, apologies, one thing, one last comment. Um, because this is a complicated issue, we ask that the Commissioner of Financial Regulations Working Group uh, that was formed to discuss this legislation and this issue uh, be reauthorized and reformed. This, the Commissioner uh, put together a working group. Uh, Senator Kramer participated, industry was invited. To well, you really are going beyond the terms. But, sorry, just talking thank about you. this bill. Um, my my point is that this is a very complicated issue. Um, the Commercial Finance Coalition supports disclosure, supports licensing, supports the ban on confessions of judgment, does not support the cap or an APR disclosure, and and my point is that this is a complicated issue that should be considered more. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this witness? Senator Kramer and Senator Benson. Senator Kramer, then Senator Benson. Thank you. And my question, very quick and easy, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Fisher, you said that the APR, uh, APR is highly technical and complicated, and you held up for the committee to see uh, Einstein's formula of relativity. Let me ask you this. Does your industry not utilize computers, input, output. Does your industry not utilize computers? Are you telling me that the formula that you held up before the committee, please share with us, is how your industry will have to calculate the APR for every one of these transactions because they don't utilize computers? Thank you for asking that. And as you said, input, output, I would characterize this as garbage in, garbage out. Because there is no fixed term and no fixed payment schedule. And so the information that will be run through that calculation will result in a disclosure that's wrong. And I appreciate your commentary about garbage, but I think what we've heard was garbage in and garbage out. But thank you very much, Madam. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think we have uh, reached that point. And we've heard all of the bills for today. And thanks to everybody who has participated. Oh, Senator Benson, you have a hand up? You got to unmute. Unmute. Uh, thank you very much. Ms. Fisher, I just want to ask a question that was asked before. Uh, uh, what procedure do you... What happens with the people who are not able to pay or the people who fail to pay? What, what process do you all follow? 
Yes, ma'am. Thank you for asking that. Uh, in a subspace finance transaction, the promise to pay is only a promise to pay a percentage of revenue to the extent that revenue is created. For example, uh, if I have a pizza restaurant, I am promising to pay 10% of the revenue I get for each slice of pizza that I sell. So if I have a great month and I sell a lot of pizza that I'm going to make, um, with the pandemic, when restaurants had to close, go only to take out, uh, have their capacity reduced significantly, those restaurants um, have their revenue drop. And so the payments by contract also would drop. Um, if the business was unable to pay because revenue had dropped, then there is no obligation to pay. There is no hmm. Now, and, and I'm not trying to be cute here because the, the business does promise not to do things such as hide money, you know, open additional bank accounts. So there are, are if the business takes um, intentional steps to deprive or cheat on what they owe, then there is recourse, but, but failure to generate enough revenue never can be an event of default under one of these contracts. So you all don't go, so you all don't go in and, and retrieve their property and go through the, you don't go into their bank accounts and you don't do those kinds of things. Is that thank, what thank you for asking. Uh, if, if the business revenue drops, then none of those actions would be taken. If the business has, let's say, um, opened a, a second bank account and they're, they're hiding their revenue into, into that second bank account so that they are you know, essentially committing fraud, then those types of actions such as um, following the Uniform Commercial Code process to exercise a security interest on perhaps their inventory and equipment, that would be an appropriate response. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that was the last question. And we've had a very interesting afternoon. We appreciate everyone's testimony and have a good evening.